really, really at my limit. I, uh, I've blown my doors. So I've gone into this kind of dark, very introverted place. As the agony of my first ultra endurance race faded into distant memory, I began to convince myself that I had actually enjoyed it. So then inevitably a question began to surface, what next? Lauf had a new gravel bike and I had unfinished business on King Alfred's Way, England's premier long distance gravel route. So a challenge was set. At 220 miles, could I do it in one go? And could I perhaps even attempt a fastest known time or FKT? Something like this needs to be done responsibly. These are public trails, so it's definitely not a race, but as a challenge, this would definitely rank as one of my toughest ever. This is the story of my attempt. And it starts here the statue of King Alfred in the centre of Winchester in the south of England, ready for a lap that takes in half the country. Well, perhaps a quarter, maybe a fifth. Anyway, tomorrow at 5am I'm going to roll out from here and the clock is not going to stop until I return. Honestly, my biggest fear is just how long it's going to take because I really don't know. But for the record, the fastest known time is Matt Page in 17 hours and 20 minutes. Matt Page is really rather good. Yeah. So, see you tomorrow, big fella. Don't be late. It's really weird, you can see up a tunic, isn't it? Right. Oh. Morning, Alfred. Here we go. It's game time. I've got to say, for once, I'm just feeling unbridled excitement at the prospect, which I hope is a good thing. Normally, I'm really just super nervous, but today has the makings of being a great day, so fingers are firmly crossed. Now, one of the great things I've just discovered about trying for an FKT is that whilst the clock won't stop until I get back here, it also doesn't start till I leave, which is just as well because I'd have missed my start by 15 minutes. Once again, I'm reminded that I am no Mark Beaumont having uh, faffed around instead of actually just get off and leave. And as you can see, the sun's pretty much come up now, but still, here we go. It's four degrees, it's a bit chilly, I'm also having to make some sacrifices on what I'm wearing because obviously as soon as I get hot I'm going to have to carry it with me for the entire day. So no overshoes, but long finger gloves. So I think that's it. I think it's time to try and ride 220 miles off-road and get back here before it gets too antisocial. This is good. I am excited. See you later, buddy. Whoop, whoop. This isn't the most perfect morning to go for an exceedingly long bike ride. Don't know what is. An FKT, well, it stands for fastest known time, and it's actually, think of it like a giant Strava segment, basically. It comes from running, and they're normally over really long distances, so like a minimum of 100 miles, often over like famous trails, like the Appalachian Trail in the States is probably the most famous. It's like 2,200 miles or something, and the fastest known time for that running is like 45 days. You have to show that you've done it. In the modern day and age of GPS, it's fairly easy to establish whether you have or you haven't done it. But back in the day, you had to prove that you'd done it. 
Um, and then it's something that's kind of grown in popularity. There's an official website. It's a bit like the uh, Everesting website, really. Um, and then I think it really took off in cycling during lockdown when all the events got cancelled. So all these gravelly dudes and mountain bike dudes would then start heading out and do these FKTs on really famous many American trails. The clock doesn't stop until you get back, obviously, but it's your total time. So not riding time, it's your total elapsed time. So any faff time is in there, and any time that you spend going wrong, going the wrong way, getting mechanical, it all counts. Um, so you've got to be efficient, not just whilst riding, but also for your whole day, basically. Been riding a few kilometers now, and I'll be honest with you, I'm starting to get cold feet about this. I mean, literally, I've got cold feet. Sorry, in my head that sounded funny. Now, we haven't talked much about pacing yet, other than to say, I'm not really sure how fast I'm gonna be able to do this. So, I was looking back at the times and the average speeds that Hank and I were doing when we tackled much of this route a couple of years ago. And fully laden, moving time, or moving speed rather, was about 22k an hour. So hopefully, I can go a bit quicker. in the bank I'm making decent progress it's absolutely just the most perfect morning for a bike ride it is incredible my only slight thing in the back of my mind is as a, am I going easy enough or am I pressing on a little bit hard and getting all excited so I've been doing a lot of zone 2 training right and I'm not entirely sure whether it's made me fitter it definitely made me better at not going fast on hills, which is probably useful here. The cheese is uh, Gouda, like literally Gouda. Save that for later. Memories are flooding back. I know this one. This is quite a tough little climb, this. I was getting to ride a very exciting bike. I don't know if you can see it behind me. Um, so, uh, so Lauf have just launched uh, a new gravel bike called the Siegler. And, uh, and when they said they were launching this, could we make a video? I was like, yes, I know exactly what we should do with it. Um, because although you can totally get a normal gravel bike around King Alfred's Way, and it's great, to do it in one go adds another element. And so the previous people that had done it quickly before we'd all use mountain bikes but I don't think a mountain bike's the fastest tool for the job around there mainly because there's massive wide handlebars so for this to have front suspension and then extra compliance built into the frame and then a normal gravel position so you've got you know your normal road handlebars see so that little bit more aerodynamic and then the handling is a bit more responsive there's, there's still some good sections of tarmac in there and so, uh, so it was a real treat actually to be able to ride that. And then unlike my previous long distance gravelly exploits, I knew that I wasn't gonna be sleeping in a hedge this time. So I traveled as light as I possibly could, perhaps a little bit too light. Maybe I could have done with another place to stash some clothing, but, um, but yeah, so I, I didn't have much with me. So as you can see, top tube bag, I don't want to say giant saddlebag because it's not, but it's, it's a fairly large saddlebag. Um, and, then, and then, yeah, my back pockets were bulging full of stuff like winter gloves and food. And Whereas on, when I'd done stuff before, I'd taken mainly like normal food and not much sports nutrition. I've got a bit more sports nutrition this time. 
and I wish I'd taken more actually because because that was what my body was craving by the end. Just attempted something that I've not done pretty much since I left the pro peloton, which is uh, going for a wee whilst riding. Uh, basically, I figured that stopping to go for a wee would ruin my average speed. So, I found the perfect stretch of road only to find it was like something out of a David Attenborough wildlife program. I dodged pheasants and rabbits the whole way down. And it was remarkably sketchy, I'm not going to lie, but everything survived intact. You'll be pleased to hear. The riding is so good on this route. At this time of year, I don't think I've ever ridden gravel anywhere else in the world that's like this. Not to say that this is better, there's just something about the combination of trails and scenery it's just so mellow it's absolutely fantastic i've actually stopped for this very solemn moment i wouldn't want you to miss one of the seven wonders of the ancient world stonehenge can you see it what do you mean it's not very impressive zoom in yeah, there you go right game on It's like straight out of Kansas, proper USA style gravel. No disrespect to USA gravel, but it's not quite as engaging as some of the like narrower, more single track style trails. There's also a nagging headwind, which I knew I was going to get on this section. I got about 100 kilometers of headwind, and then it does mean that I'll finish with a tailing. So I think it's probably the right way around. But it feels like slow going up here. So it's quite desolate up here. It's a bit eerie with all the military stuff going on. And I don't know, it's a bit bleak for my taste. Give me a nice bluebell wood any day of the week. Oh, there you go, a bit of civilization for you. It's been some dark times, mate. Dark times. A little update. So we've got just 100 miles on the clock, just under. And I've been on the road for seven hours, so six hours 40 ride time. If I carry on at this pace, then I'm well up on my sort of schedule that I'd loosely pieced together. So, uh, so that's good. I've been motoring through my nutrition. I've eaten most of my science and sports, sports nutrition already. Uh, but I thought at this point, with 100 miles on the clock, I'd have a ceremonial bakewell. Uh, the epic ingredients list uh, I noticed last night included titanium. So, uh, well, titanium's never bad, is it? Especially not in a bakewell tart. Please shut the gate, it says. You know why? Cows. F cows. And these ones look mean as well, like really mean. So. Okay, right.
They're all staring. They're eyeing me up. Whether that's because they think that I'm breakfast or just because they're aggressive and they want to fight. I hate cows. I think I might have got away with it this time though. There is a bit of controversy around FKTs in that is it acceptable to be effectively trying to ride quickly on public paths? And I, t I do get that. And actually, when I was doing some research about who had the quickest time around King Alfred's Way, and there was an awful lot of internet forums saying that you should not be attempting it. And I, and I sympathise because, you know, I'm all too aware of the damaging effects of one cyclist acting like a dick on the trails. You can have 99 people being amazing and well behaved and one person can ruin it for all of us. But then I was thinking, well, that one person that rides like an idiot is probably going to be riding like an idiot whether they've got a stopwatch or not. You know, whether you're trying to do the whole thing in one or you're trying to get Strava segments on the way around. And so my own approach to it is just be nice, courteous, sensible, pedestrians take right of way, you've got to shut all gates, you take all rubbish with you, you, you just, you're just a, a normal, responsible human being, like a member of society. And actually that takes precedence over a stopwatch. And actually I suppose the other thing that I was thinking of is that if I was to go and ride a section of King Alfred's Way, you know, as part of a normal two hour bike ride, I would probably inevitably be going a lot quicker. Like, you go slow when you're riding 220 miles. And so each section I was doing less quickly than I would do if I was just out riding normally. So I was thinking, well, in that case, I'm not actually going to be doing anything that's detrimental to other users of the countryside or for the future security of a route like King Alfred's. I am still on the Ridgeway, which is taking its toll a bit. I'm starting to feel pretty tired now. I've been riding for seven hours, done 170k, to nearly halfway, which is great, but I think I've forgotten how much of this route is the Ridgeway. And, uh, I suppose when all said and done it's relatively easy kilometers but it's just not terribly inspiring after a good few hours of it maybe on a nice summer's day you stop for a picnic maybe if you've got hang for company making them eat slow berries but today i just want to get it done mentally I've set a little marker for when I hit the River Thames. And so I think I'm just counting down the kilometers till then. I think I've made it. I think I'm off the Ridgeway at last. And I think I'm now Oh, in the safety of the Thames Valley. My main thing at the moment is starting to get really sore triceps, which will probably surprise you given the size of my triceps. The bucolic River Thames. Oh, I'm so, so pleased to get here. Oh, that last 100 kilometers is really dragged. I'm not a fan of Ridgeway, if you've not worked that out yet already. Or rather, I'm not a fan of Ridgeway today. Anyway, this is cool. We have got to Streetly, which is a lovely village by the Thames. There is an amazing cafe there. I know it's amazing, because me and Hank went there. 
a couple of years ago. Got 176k on the clock, so it's almost exactly halfway. And I've been riding for, mm, what's that coming up? I've been riding seven and a half hours, but seven hours 50 has elapsed. Okay, so we're still doing all right. We're ahead of schedule, but I can't dilly dally. So uh, I'm going to crack on. Leg warmers coming off. Mmm, delightful. Gluten free pita bread with gouda cheese. Gouda cheese is not, does not want it's, do what it says on the tin. It's not that good. Just a bit. run into Reading now. I'm actually craving sugar at the minute. And I can't find the gel that I've taken out of my saddlebag at this precise moment. It's in one of four pockets. I can't work out which one. It's testament to both the city of Reading and King Alfred's Way route planners that they've managed to get you through a major urban centre without riding on roads. That's incredible. But all those hard earned kilometres, there's also a feeling of frustration now that making quite a lot of wrong turns. There it is. Ah. No, hang on a minute. Oh, making quite a lot of wrong turns, as you can see. I'm trying to adopt a fairly uh, calm mentality, which is that each section just takes as long as it takes. And if it's slow for me, it's slow for everyone else. So that's that. Fingers crossed. I, uh, I've blown my doors. I wasn't entirely sure whether I'd already blown my doors or not. Now I definitely know that I've completely blown my doors. Uh, I'm in desperate need of sugar. So um, my second treat, which actually the first time around didn't feel like much of a treat, my titanium oxide Bakewell tart is coming out. Um, I just need something really sweet and I've run out of gels and bars. So all I've got is water and pizza breads with cheese. Oh God. Anyway, we're getting to some civilization soon so I can stock up there. actually that so much tarmac you know it's you know it's getting bad when you start preferring tarmac to gravel but I'm at that point now Okay, first, first smash and grab. Uh, I've got 100k left to do, just about. And I think you can see from what I've bought, what state I'm in. So we've got sugar, uh, sugar and fat, and sugar, fat, and potentially some complex carbohydrates, but not very much. So uh, yeah, I'm gonna get it down me, get it in my pockets and crack on. Time is, time is ticking.
like that was amazing like I might have been very rude about the Ridgeway but I am a big fan of Surrey riding like it was a lot of fun sandy single track it was mint but dragging myself up here all the way up to the top of Hindhead or Devil's Punch Pod or wherever we are oh I feel broken and I'm broken to the point where I haven't actually managed to eat anything so I stopped at a garage bought a load of sugar and then it's just sat in my back pockets so um, I think I need to go and buy, buy some salt and vinegar crisps <laughs> oh, but the trouble is I don't know what else I want so uh, also I'm at that point where every time I get out of the saddle I go like, like an old man getting out of a chair Probably tail. It's getting towards evening now. So it's got past seven. We've got three hours. We've got 54 kilometres to do. So it's still doable. But I've got three monster climbs coming up. This is the first to get onto the South Downs. The good news, though, I managed to start eating again. So that's cool. There it is, the wall. Now, don't you say that it doesn't look that much. That is savage. Hank had to get off and walk when we came up here a couple of years ago. And I have a feeling I might do the same, which is gonna wreck my average speed. And it could well be the end. conquered now I imagine a question that some maybe many of you are thinking is why on earth would you want to tackle a beautiful route like this steeped in 10,000 years of history and peppered with fantastic country pubs and tea shops and just miss all of that and it's a very good point. I would definitely, definitely, definitely recommend anyone to tackle this or similar with friends and family and take your time to see the best of what the country has to offer, basically. But then there's also something else. This is different. This is a different challenge and it's enjoyable for completely different reasons. I like pushing myself, and I am pushing myself. But also, there's just a real joy to moving efficiently, and there's also a joy to having a reason to ride fast and not dilly-dally. It's, it's been cracking good fun. Whether I make it back for oh, quarter past 10 or not, I'll be a bit annoyed if I don't make it. There's no two ways about it. The sun has definitely set. It's getting dark and my lights are going to have to come on. For the first time since I switched them off. 15 hours ago maybe. 
So, I'm really, really up my limit. And for the first time, this ride, I sort of thought how nice it would be just not to be doing it, just to make it stop. The last few hours where my body was kind of shutting down, I was dehydrated, but I just didn't want to drink anything. I didn't want to, I, it's something I've experienced a few times. It was like I just didn't have the mental capacity to look after myself anymore. So I'd gone into this kind of dark, very introverted place where I knew I could just keep my pedals turning. And um, so the last four hours, I was completely blown. I was dehydrated, I was sore. And I just knew that the finish line was there, the clock was ticking, and I had to get there somehow. And it was, uh, yeah, it was dark. It was really dark. Right, I don't know whether you can see my rather tired, grizzled face, but I think this is the last proper climb of the route now. You can hear how much I'm breathing. I'm barely turning the pedals, but I'm just, just running on fumes. Now I stopped looking at how far I've got to go. I stopped looking at the time. Didn't want to see, I wasn't gonna make it, but that has left me feeling slightly anxious that I'm not. I feel like I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place there. I've just gone into that place, like, not a trance, but just kind of like withdrawn into myself. I've still got that double espresso caffeine gel in my saddlebag, it's gonna go untouched. I just can't be bothered to get my headphones out and have a little cry. Just, just wanna get it done now. Head down, man. Yeah. Get your head down, you've done it. Less than an hour, easy. It's weird. I just want to go to bed. I just really want to go to bed. There's Winchester. I'm going to do it. Well, I'm going to get back. I still don't know whether I'm going to get the time. Look at you! Ow! Oh my god. What's the time? I actually can't tell the time. What is the time? Is that. I feel like Phileas Fogg in Around the World in 80 Days. Uh, 10, ah, 10, 13, I made it! Yes! No, I need to celebrate. I'm not even on the bus. Ah, totally meaningless, but incredibly amazing personal achievement. Ah, oh my goodness me. I thought it would never end. Genuinely, I thought it would never end. That was absolutely savage. So yeah, what's that? 16 hours and about 50 something minutes. I will take that. Oh my God. Well, I guess all that's left for me to say is thank you very much for watching. Thank you very much to Lauf for lending me your new Siegler. I genuinely, I couldn't have done it without it. These forks, oh my word. There's a video over on GCN Tech, that's what I meant to tell you, uh, where I talk through all the tech on the bike and also my equipment that I've used as well. So, 
yeah, make sure you go check that out. Link in the description. Oh, I'm going to bed. I honestly have no idea if I'm going to finish. I don't know whose idea this was. <sighs> yep, that's me. Completely cooked, 100 miles into the longest ride I've ever undertaken. What on earth was I thinking? My brother just said, why the f are you doing this? I'm praying for you. <laughs> Roughly three months and two days ago, I threw my name into the hat to try and ride the Steamboat Gravel Race in the heart of the Rockies. And it wasn't just any of the four loops that you could choose from, but the longest one, 224 kilometer gravel loop. Up until now, my longest ride is 180 kilometers, a massive 44 kilometers shorter. But lucky enough, I've had some help with my training along the way. Plus, when we mentioned this to our mates at Ribble, they were super keen to get involved too. So with training in hand and a bike in another, I have very little reason to back out now. Half an hour before the start of the race, bike is all prepped. I'm all prepped, got so much food in my back pockets. That's all I have to do now is eat the food and ride my bike. I physically can't fit any more food in my back pocket. So yeah, so final little preparations now to get ready and then head to the start line. <laughs> Yikes. Starting to feel real now. Still got quite a while to the start, but thought I'd line up early. To start, I got quite a good position on the grid. I got there, I'd say I was maybe like 150 people back from the start, uh, which was quite good. And then we had the first bit, which was neutralized, which it was okay. There was just a lot of people everywhere. And when I get in that situation, I get very competitive. I'm like, oh, I need to get to the front. I don't know why I needed to get to the front in the neutral section, but I felt the need. So I kind of got quite close to the front. Um, and then as soon as we hit the gravel, that was like, yeah, it all just started to string out. So I knew it was going to be dusty because we on gravel, but literally after that first gravel section, I was covered in dust. My bike was filthy. Keeping my heart rate a little bit higher than it should, so I found myself quite a nice big group to sit in now, so just trying to wheel suck as best as I can, but less than 200k to go. That's good. <laughs> So the kilometers are slowly ticking down, 45 kilometers in, I've just stopped at a uh, feed zone, thought I'd better get some water just in case, but yeah everybody kind of split up the feed so kind of on my own a little bit now, but yeah 45k down, can't do the maths to however many are to go but I'm just going to keep pedaling and the kilometers are going to tick down slowly. Just had some single track. 
was very bumpy and fun. Almost like a cyclocross race. But back on the smooth tarmac now, but I can't believe how like disgusting it is already. So much like dust. I mean, look at the state of the bike already. miles to go. Wow. You do need to keep on checking in with yourself. Like sometimes you can forget how far you have to go. So yeah, I mean, two, two hours, 38 minutes in already. Um, just need to keep on riding at my own pace. It's quite hard to be with a group and they're pushing a little bit out of your comfort zone. And you're like, Oh, if I could just stay with them a little bit longer, it'd be good. But you're better off. Just kind of riding at your own pace. Slow and steady definitely wins the race in this case. Now you're probably wondering, what is this bike I'm riding? Well, you can't actually see because of all the dust. So. And plus, I haven't got the energy to tell you right now. So here's something I prepared a little bit earlier. Yep, I knew I would be a little bit too tired to tell you about my bike, but this is Ribble's Pure Gravel Machine, the Ribble Gravel SL. It's fast, it's responsive, it's light. It's pretty much everything I need for this event. It's got a carbon frame. Another really cool thing about Ribble is that all the components are completely changeable. So if you want a different size stem or different size handlebars, you can do that. Whereas a lot of other bike brands, you kind of get what you're given. So that's another really cool thing. I've also got 650 B wheels on here with 47 mil fast tires. The bike, you can get it with 700 C wheels, but I've op opted for 650. The size of the frame is extra small. Uh, what else have I got? Nice flared handlebars for a bit extra comfort. So they're going to be really good for this long ride. I've got SRAM Rival Group Set 1x with a nice big granny ring on the back, which I'm going to be very thankful for. And I'm definitely going to need going up those hills. This bike also has a load of mountain points to put bags on if you're going adventure riding, you want to strap your tent on, your sleeping bag, which hopefully I'm not going to need. Hopefully it's not going to be an overnight job, but I'm actually going to count how many mounts there are. So, one, two. 20. 21 mountain points. You can fit your whole kitchen sink on this bike if you wanted to. And the last little cool detail, I've got my tyre setup tubeless and you might have seen these nice little cool flashy pink muck-off valves. Do you like that? Very nice. But now, back to future Manon suffering in the race. God help you Manon. Hang on halfway. And I feel like this is really where, where it starts. That last 100k was in my comfort zone. From here on in, not in my comfort zone, and I can feel it already. Woo! Be eating a grasshopper. I haven't eaten one, I really don't want to. They're so big. They're evil, they're like little birds. They're absolutely everywhere, and when you're suffering, and you've got your mouth open, oh, it's not a good, it's not a good combination. Yeah, I had one in my ear hole then. Right, save your energy. No screaming. Black horse, black horse, right there. Black horse. Oh, oh that's so good. Yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, that's good. Right, I'm ready to go. Woo. <laughs> so I've just come 
about the feed zone. And the plan was, you know, to take a minute, go to the toilet, have some snacks, sort my back pockets out. What did I do? I just grabbed some water and ran. I don't know why, but I just panicked. I said, like, oh my God, I need to go. But on the next one, make sure I stop. <laughs> oh. This turned out to be a bigger mistake than I first thought. This is a really hard bit of gravel road and I feel like I've almost hit a wall and there's still a long way to go. A little bit worried. There was a point I was like, I'm not going to make it to the finish. Um, I was really struggling. Every single pedal stroke hurt. I didn't want to pedal and it was all like a really gradual uphill. There was that one bit of road that just killed me off and I don't know what it is. It wasn't anything steep. It was just a really draggy, gravel road and I found it really hard. My head was falling off, my legs were falling off. I couldn't sit down. I just needed to get off the bike. It's really starting to kick in now. And it's getting to that point where I just don't want to eat. I just, I just feel sick. And it's like shoving food down you. It's not pleasant, but if it gets me to the finish line, that's what I have to do. But I'm full on in survival mode now. Just pedaling. I can hardly keep my hand up to hold this camera. It feels like it weighs a ton. I'm gonna have to turn it off. I could not wait to get to that feed zone and every other feed zone before that I kind of stopped for like a few minutes, got some water and got straight back. But this one I was like I need to get off my bike, I need to have a sit down, I need to reevaluate the situation and then go from there. Oh my God, <laughs> whose idea was this? I honestly have no idea if I'm gonna finish. I, quite, I actually quite like pickles. So I'm hoping this is gonna give me I don't actually know what's meant to do, but everybody raves on about pickles and pickle juice and gravel, so here we go. Ooh. Mmm. Hi, Caramba. stop it was very touch and go you know when you're just pedaling so all you want to do is stop and every single pedal stroke hurts and every bump in the road really makes me angry I do feel a lot better now I definitely needed that but once the last 40 miles oh god I hope I can make it the weather has just all of a sudden turned it's got very grey, very cloudy, which is actually quite nice because it was so hot before. I wouldn't mind a little bit of a, a shower. I'd be very welcome right now.
<laughs> made it. I finally got my pickles. Is it really weird that I really like them? So, finishing stretch now. So I've got a pickle in my mouth, but I'm gonna get going so I don't stop for too long on my legs or my legs will stop. <coughs> oh, that pickle. I've now officially made it past the longest I've ever ridden. 193 kilometers in the bag. Not too long to go now, but um, this might be a little bit too much information, but my bottom is very sore. Whoa, multitasking. Um, this gravel thing is not for the faint hearted. You have to be hard, strong. You can tell I'm f***ed now because I'm talking absolute shit. Officially into the last 20 kilometers and whew, it's touch and go. One minute I feel okay, the next I'm like, wow. My head's like, I'm gonna get off this bike right now. Oh, and every single little incline, so painful. It was probably like the last like 6K of the race that I realized that I've actually, I am gonna finish this and I am gonna actually do it. I don't think it like kicked in till then. And I think like coming into this race, I had a lot of worry and doubt just because it's the unknown. I've never done anything like this before at this distance, especially on gravel. Um, so it was, it was quite an emotional finish. I was quite proud of myself. Um, and yeah, it was definitely an achievement. It just goes to show that our bodies are a lot more capable than we think, or well, we shouldn't doubt ourselves. Leaving all my worries, I prepare for something new. Whatever it was that held me back, I'm sure it wasn't true. Um, the event for me in a sentence. It was an emotional roller coaster, but a very enjoyable one. And now that I finish and I've had a little bit of time to recover, I, it's been some very good memories and I'd like to do it again. 576 kilometers, 358 miles long. 19,000 feet of elevation in total. It's Britain's oldest highway from the English Channel to the North Sea. And I'm gonna to attempt to do it in just one go. This is the Old Chalkway. It's 6am and the wind is well, picking up. We're on the coast here and the start of my adventure. 
Now, last time I did an adventure like this was a few years ago, back with Cy, when we took on the King Alfred's Way, my first bikepacking gravel adventure. Now, this time, I'm gonna try not to crash, lose my phone, and eat a bit of carrot cake slightly more politely. But I absolutely loved it. Fair to say, we took our time. We had a sleeping bag and a bottle of wine, and we enjoyed it, and I loved it. But this time, I wanna do it light and fast. I wanna see if I can go do 576K in one go. Now, I'm not racing any one or anything, but the beauty of crossing a massive chunk of the UK in one go, all without traffic, has lured me in. Now, I'm at the start line of the Old Chalk Way. Behind me is the English Channel, and I'm starting from a small town called Lyme Regis. Now, between me and home next to the sea lies 576 kilometers, and I'm following an old chalk spine. Now, this is going to be a mammoth ride, and uh, I reckon one of my hardest challenges yet. All done on my own. There's no going back now. The wind's behind me. It's time to get going. It goes. The great thing about starting by the channel is that I've got a tailwind to start with. I'm just hoping this tailwind carries on. Now I'm going to make it out, and then I'm going to tell you more about what bike I'm riding and what wheels I have as well, which is also pretty important to this epic ride. Breakfast. Now I'm settling into a bit of a rhythm. I'm like 15, 20 K in. Now there's some climbs on this route and some tough ones at that. It's in total 19,000 feet of climbing. And it's meant to take you around four to six days, this route, if you're gonna enjoy it. But I'm trying to do it in one ride. And just like that, the heaven, heavens have opened. And I am absolutely soaked. I don't know whether to wait it out because it was blown over pretty fast or continue trucking away in torrential rain. And I've still got a slight smile on my face. So I'm still enjoying it. On some proper rough stuff now. And this is quite slow going. I think it's time I take a quick break and I tell you more about what I'm riding and the wheels I'm riding too. Now don't forget, there's a in-depth look at exactly what I'm using over on the tech channel. Right, let's uh, well cut to me having a break. Oh, I needed that break. Now I haven't taken fast and light to an extreme with the minimal kit I'm taking, but it's also the equipment that I'm riding on. Now I'm riding on the Pinarello Greville, uh, equipped with Campagnolo e-car group set. But my secret weapon are these, the Kdex AR35 wheels. Let me give you some of the headline stats. We have carbon hookless rim with an internal width of 25 millimeter, meaning you can run everything from 28 millimeter road tires all the way to 45 millimeter chunky boy gravel tires. We've got carbon spokes, ceramic bearings, and as I mentioned, they weigh just 1,270 grams a pair. That's lighter than loads of the road wheels. I'm also using Kdex's GX gravel tire in a 40 millimeter width. This is one of two gravel tires Kdex make. I won't go into every detail about all the bikes that I'm now because Alex is hitting it over on GCN Tech and you can see all the nerdy details about my setup. Right, it's enough talking about this. I better get on and ride it. Ah! Oh, I need that break. So this is a lot harder than I was expecting. Now you've probably already noticed that I am uh, wearing road shoes with a carbon sole. Yeah, story behind that is that my uh, mountain bike shoes on my uh, SBDs and off-road shoes 
were lost in luggage. So I only had these shoes left. Now I've got to say, it's made it really tough because I can't get off my bike. And there's some stuff back there that I had to walk up. And then you spend 10 minutes effort and blinding trying to get mud out your cleats. Quite a proper gravel trail. It's fair to say it's pretty slow going. You can tell how bumpy it is. Not doing too bad. Not doing too bad. Still going strong. Hi, yeah. just come in Salisbury off the route and I didn't know when I was going to find a coffee shop or a cafe and I haven't stopped and it's 12.30. I've only had three bars and two bottles of water so saw this amazing bakery and I couldn't help myself. Look at these. Recently it's just been up, down, up, down, hence why it's been so slow going. It's been hard though, first 70 miles, it's been tough. Tell me if the red flag is flying, well, they're firing. So uh, I need to find a big loop round. Balls. No one likes turning round and going a longer way, especially when you've got a oh, massive ride to go. Anyway, I'd rather not get shot. So I've just pulled over, jumped in the front seat while we stopped here for a minute because I was feeling a bit dizzy to be honest because I just haven't eaten enough. But there's been a few moments where it's got a bit twitchy and the puddles, because there's been so much rain, the puddles are just so deep. And there's a few moments where I didn't really deck it. I've been soaked about 10 times. It's like shower on, shower off, shower on, shower off, shower on, shower off. We love it though, we do love it. I've done 220k since 6.30 and it's now four. I've been riding 10 out of... Oh, that's pacey that. Because if I did another 220 in 10 hours, that would take me to 4.40. Yeah. We'll be done by breakfast. So I couldn't find any lube and this is a hack I haven't done before. But I'm using olive oil. A lot of it. There you go, just for good measure. Now, as we ride across this beautiful ridgeway with, well, beautiful scenery and these chalk tracks, I should probably tell you like, what route I'm following. Now I'm following the ancient trails. Now they're made up nowadays of four ridgeways. So it's the Wessex Ridgeway, the Ridgeway, the Icknield Path, and the Pedders Way. Now they all make up what's known as the Greater Ridgeway. I've got to say, it is absolutely stunning, but today the riding's been tough. Oh, I can't get doing this. It's just so boggy. These finer chalk bits. There you go. So much easier when it hits chalk. But as soon as it goes to this bog, it's just so slidey. You slide all over the place. So 
So we're coming into the golden hour on the Ridgeway. I've been going 12 hours, around about 240 odd K. So beautiful though. I'm not gonna lie, I had some rough moments early on where it was just boggy, it was, the elevation was hard and it was so wet, but with a good tailwind, blue sky, and some unbelievable views, it's kind of turned my mindset around and I'm just starting to enjoy it. Starting to love it actually, it's good to say. But I'm gonna crack on into the darkness and uh, hopefully I can make up some good headway before having a quick kip. Look at that sky, the sun's going down. It's around eight o'clock. It's been a long, long day. I've made it to Henley on Thames. And it's beautiful. I wish I could enjoy it with a nice pub dinner. But not today. So tonight is actually the first night ride on my own, riding through the night. I am gonna take a little nap though at some point. Foot long, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Something just quite nice about just being able to eat what the hell you want. Because he burnt so many calories, you can't almost get in there. Day one of the Old Chalk Way has been biblical. The reason I say biblical is because the weather has genuinely been biblical. The scenery has been unbelievable. But it's not gonna happen. I'm pretty tired now. It has to be said, so I don't think I'll do much longer. Right, I'm still riding. Way past 12, but I'm making really good progress. I've hit a road section, which has been, well, a bit of a lifesaver because I was struggling on the dirt, so wet and boggy, and I just can't see where I'm going. Depends why I haven't filmed, I've just been trying to keep it rubber side down. But I'm still going. I don't think I'm gonna make it to Cambridge, that's for sure. Here I am. I've gone till pretty late. I'd say it's about 4 a.m. Well, no, 3 a.m. 3, 4 a.m. Anyway, I've lost count. I made it past, I think it's uh, Roston. Anyway, I'm getting a bit delirious now. Been riding for a solid, solid chunk of time. And I'm feeling absolutely nailed. I found this golf course, because it always has nice grass. Don't know if I'm allowed to be here, but I'm gonna get a couple hours as a kip, because I've absolutely smashed it, and uh, I'm feeling pretty tired now. Oh, that's hard. That was hard. Right, that night. Good morning, you beautiful people. I don't feel beautiful at all. I slept like absolute rubbish. I had about two hours, two hours, and I was just so cold. Oh, feeling definitely worse for wear. My knees are sore and my ankles are sore, but it's just the continuous riding that I'm not really used to doing. Right, I better get going because I'm getting really, really cold, and um, I just want to get this done now. <laughs> I've broken the back of it now, so it gets flatter now. But I want a coffee ASAP. Nothing's open yet. Before the sun got up, I needed to have a rest. Although I don't think I could complete this in one go without sleeping. So, where do you decide to stop? Stopped in a nice golf course, I did. Which was lovely. 
except they had the bloody crow scarers on there. Boom. Boom. We're heading north towards Cambridge. We're in Essex. I'm so lost where I am, I'm just following my navigation. Right, on the bike we go, Newmarket, coffee, bomb, let's go, bomb. It's tough going today, but I'm gonna just do what I can, keep plodding on, and eventually we'll hit the North Sea. This is, this is the dream, hot food, croissant, and a coffee made by these lovely guys. Right, here we go. Food, baby, ah yeah. <laughs> Nothing like a good bit of hot food in the morning. I literally didn't mind what it was, just hot food. It has to be said, this route has been pretty unrelenting. It's been, you kind of never get a respite from being on the pedals, but you are rewarded with the most incredible bits of scenery. For me, I wasn't racing anyone. Just wanted to prove to myself that I could do it on my own. I'm 71k from the finish. Oh, it's so beautiful here. But I've just gone through an absolute downpour. Um, but yeah, 71k to go. Just plug it, just plug away. 71k, I can do that. 40 miles, or 40k from the finish. I'm really suffering now. Ah. Everything's hurting. Now, Norfolk's known for being flat, and I've got to say, that's why I love it. Because the great thing is, to come to the end of the ride, or the last 100K, and it's all flat, yeah, baby! Dorset, horrific. Now, I'm on the home straight. There's about 25K of just long, straight road and I'm on it. This is what I was looking forward to about 14 hours ago. It's been over 32 hours, 588 kilometers, and I'm finally getting to see the North Sea. Oh, what a journey. I've loved it and hated it all at the same time been brutal, weather's been hard, terrain's been difficult, but it's been an amazing experience and an eye opener at that. But here we are, we're going onto the beach. Oh. My first solo ultra endurance epic off-road, on gravel, completed, and I'm so happy about it. I'm not one to normally ride on my own, but I've got to say I've loved every minute of it. Just no music, nothing, just me in the open outdoors and this great route. So the old chalkway is finally completed. It took me 33 hours to complete in total. That's all my laps time, so that's with my rests, short ones at that. What was the hardest bit? The hardest bit was the relentless terrain. Uh, gravel rides and off-road ultras are just so hard because it's just unrelenting. That would be one of the hardest bit. Also, the weather was not on my side. The only thing that was on my side was the wind, and that really did help me a lot. I had a tailwind the whole way across the country. What would I change? 
Well, for starters, I wouldn't wear road shoes. That was a big error. So if you're taking part on a gravel ride, I would not wear road shoes. But unfortunately, I didn't have a chance because I didn't have any of my mountain bike shoes with me. The bike, the wheels, I mean, it speaks for themselves, doesn't it? It was uh, a joy to ride and, yeah, it was amazing to be able to take this thing from Lyme Regis yesterday all the way here. What a ride. Would I do it again? Probably not in a hurry. So here we are. The Suffer Fest is over. 32 hours later from the Channel to the North Sea. The old chalkway is complete. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, let me know in the comment section below what you thought of this epic adventure. Massive thank you to Kdex Wheels for helping make this video possible. And I hope that I'll see you in the next video, but it might be after a while because I need a rest. Anyway, if you like this video, give a big thumbs up. And I'll see you sometime. Flanders, with its rich racing heritage and numerous cobbled climbs, or bergs as they're known in Flemish, is an absolute must bucket list destination for any cyclist. So naturally, we've come here to see if I can ride all 59 bergs in a single ride. Can we complete Flanders in a day? Whose idea was this? To make this ride possible, we've teamed up with Light Skin Likes and Flanders Tourism, cyclinginflanders.cc. They've devised this mental challenge, which anyone can have a go at on any day of the year that you like. Although you don't have to do it in one single ride, like us. I don't know why we're doing that. You actually have 72 hours to complete the challenge. You click a link on their website, which connects your Strava, and then as you complete each segment of each berg, it ticks them off. If you do them all within 72 hours, then you can come here to the Centrum Ronde van Flanderen, where they will engrave a cobble with your name on it and put it on the wall of fame. How cool is that? Cycling in Flanders suggests doing the Flandrian Challenge over three or four days and have routes that you can download on their website. However, to do it in one ride, our route starts in Gerardsbergen, where we will tackle one of the most infamous bergs, the Muir, before heading over to the bergs around Udenarde and the likes of the fearsome Koppenberg and Oder Quermont. From there, we will make our way towards Kortrijk and on to Kemmel to include the bergs from Ghent Vevelgem and hopefully finish our ride. It's 290 kilometers long with over 4,000 meters of climbing. And if you'd like to have a go at it yourself, well, the Kamut link is in the description. Time to get cracking. It's 6 a.m., about three degrees, and we're in Gerardsbergen for the start of this ridiculous challenge. Just over there behind me is actually the Remco Venepool fan club. Uh, you, you couldn't make it up. Anyway, we're at the bottom of the Muir, the first of the big bergs that we're going to take on without any warm up, straight in. That's going to hit it and then, well, that's going to be followed in quick succession by the Bossberg. So let's, uh, well, let's, let's get going. It's going to be a long day. <laughs> So I've just started the first official segment and in, by doing that, I've started the countdown timer. 72 hours has started now for me to complete all of them. Hopefully it won't take that long because we don't have that long. I'm hoping for more like 12 hours, but let's get cracking.
This is it, climb number two, the Bossberg. And these two climbs coming in quick succession is often a feature of on loop het newsblad and also the Tour of Flanders. It, back along the way we came. <laughs> this is Berg 3, the Valkenberg. <laughs> KOM's about 58 seconds. I'm going to be double that, <laughs> but uh, the sun's starting to come up. What a glorious sunrise. Yes. Oh, I love it when you start in the dark and you get sunrise. It's great. This is what epic adventure rides are all about. Like, you get up in the morning, it's dark, it's a bit grim, but then you get sunrises and views like this. Look at that, it's amazing. Beautiful cloud inversions in the trees. Can't stop for long though, because I'm only three bergs in, I've got 56 to go. Not who, uh, <laughs> never gonna get it done. Every time you reach a berg, cycling in Flanders has marked it out on the road. And there's a corresponding Strava segment. I've got them all on my Wahoo. It's quite funny because it's useful for navigation <laughs> and knowing where you're at, but I'm about double the time on each of these bergs compared to what the pros do. But <laughs> this isn't a race. If I was to race up them as hard as I could go, I mean, I probably wouldn't finish. It's a real endurance task, so I'm pacing myself. Is it my first rodeo? About 65 kilometers in at this point, done about 12 bergs, although I've lost count. <laughs> and uh, at the moment, I'm feeling all right, but I do need to press on, and there's a lot more bergs to go. <laughs> so when you're doing a ride as long as this, in terrain as challenging as this, and having to contend with a northern European climate, which doesn't always behave itself, the bike and kit you use is incredibly important. And you might have noticed that well, I've got a rather intriguing front light on, and that's the front light that we've been provided by Lightskin. It's called the Naka Road, and uh, well, it's intriguing shape is because it's aero. And you guys know how much I love aero. 
just by saving a wall or two here or there over the course of a 289 kilometer ride, I'll take whatever I can get. The route has just taken us through Udenade uh, and past the Centrum Ronde van Vlaanderen. So there's a cafe here. I'm going to get myself some local delicacies. Have a quick pit stop. Look at this, old Eddie Merck's old team car. It's well cool. Right. Right. So for my pit stop, I've got a hot chocolate with this chocolate lollipop and this local delicacy, the Ristat. Um, the best way to describe it, if you've not had one, and you absolutely should, is it's kind of like a sort of pastry case with a sort of rice pudding centre. Kind of a bit like a custard tart, but rice. Anyway, they're great. This challenge is as much an eating challenge as it is a riding one. <laughs> They've got plenty of beta fuel, get all the carbs in. Cobbles are coming thick and fast now. This had like four sectors almost back to back. Oh God, this is tough. It really takes it out of you in ways that just other roads don't. And I'm not even halfway. <laughs> oh. The bergs were coming thick and fast. I was constantly ticking off iconic climbs, many of which I'd only ever seen before on TV. Approaching, though, was one that scared me, one of the big ones, perhaps the most fearsome and infamous berg of all, the Koppenberg. This is it, the Copperberg, the segment says go. Oh man, this climb is often a pivotal moment in the Tour of Flanders. And when the Tour of Flanders is on, it's just lined with screaming fanatical Belgian and Flandrian fans. Not today, it's just me. But that, that's kind of one of the coolest things about cycling and why you'd come here and do this mad challenge is because, you know, you can't go and as easily go and play a, a game in Madison Square Garden or have a game of football in Wembley or whatever your sport is that you like, but you can come here and ride these bergs. Although I am questioning that particular life choice at the moment. <laughs> this is savage. Oh man. And if you want to watch these climbs in amazing races, and you can do on GCN Plus. But also, we've got some good documentaries, such as How to Win the Tour of Flanders. That's on there too. Oh, God. Uh, it's bloody hard. That's all you need to know. What a wall.
This is a f this one. This is the Tyenberg, and there's a picture of Tom Bonin there, also known as the Bonenberg. The Tyenberg actually translates as just, well, tough hill, but uh, it's also known as the Bonenberg because it's where Tom Bonin launched many of his race winning moves in E3 Harlebeck. And, uh, well, one time he dropped his chain on this climb as well, but hopefully that doesn't happen to me. But, oh, it's like 15% and like cobbles and horrible. Oh, oh, it's tough. It's only 530 meters though. Come on. Yeah, it's the top hill, yeah. So the KOM on this climb is 55 seconds and it's taken me more than double that. <laughs> Two minutes, five seconds. Bloody hell. Ugh. Humbling. I can really feel it in my legs now. We've got about 100 kilometers to go, but we've had a load of really steep bergs in quick succession and the cobbles just take it out of you. Oh, it's hard. This is the Uda Quermont now. One of the final bergs in this area before we head over to the Ghent Vevelgem sort of region towards Quartrike. Oh, about 90k to go on this ride. Broken the back, but this is going to sting. Hopefully about two and a half hours left riding. Oh, done well over 200k. It's gonna be about 295k ride, I think. Oh, feeling it. But, home stretch. Having completed 50 bergs, it was time to cross through the city of Kortrijk and head west on an incredible bike path along the River Leia. This would take us towards the bergs of Ghent Vevelgem so we could tick off the remaining nine. Last 50k. Come on, let's have it. Just coming into the last 30 kilometers of this ride now. I'm absolutely cream crackered, but I know I'm going to get it done. This has been amazing. All I can think about right now is waffles and beer and pannekoeken and all the other great Belgian treats. This is it, I've arrived at the final berg, the Zandberg. Whew. Right, gonna smash it out, and then I'm gonna head to the Flanders Centre and get my prize, my engraved cobble, to show that I've completed Flanders. Yeah, let's do it. What a ride that was. I've synced it up onto my phone, connected the Flandrian Challenge on Strava, and I've completed all 59 segments. So I'm here at the Ronde van Flanderen Centre to get my, uh, my cobble with my name engraved on it so I can put it on the wall of fame. And to give you an idea of like, oh, that ride, right? I just have a, had a look at the stats. 7,250 calories of it yesterday. <laughs> like it was a big day out. And uh, if you're interested, it was 11 and a half hours moving time and 13 hours total. So yeah, big day, but what an amazing experience. Let's go get that cobble.
I've got my engraved mini cobble, so all that remains now is to stick it on the wall of fame. And at the moment, only around 720 people have completed the challenge, and only a small handful of those have done it in one day, like we did. So, where shall I stick it? Have a look. There we go. Go here, right in the middle. There you have it, the Flandrian Challenge, Flanders completed. And uh, what an amazing ride that is. And as mentioned, this is something that anyone can do. It doesn't cost you anything. You can come here, do the challenge, and if you complete the segments, then you can go and get a cobble engraved like, like I did, which is fantastic. And although we did it in one ride, I'd probably recommend that you do it in sort of three or four days over several rides, which is what Cycling in Flanders recommends on their Flandrian Challenge website. And they have routes that you can do and, uh, and take part in yourself if you fancy it. So if you've enjoyed this video and like to give the challenge a go yourself, then give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already for more content and more videos of this nature. And uh, I'm gonna go, go now. Exia um, Dak. That means I love you, bye in Flemish. This video is not about me. It's not about the challenge. It's about the power of sport. It's about bringing people together for a bigger purpose, for a greater goal. Doddy Weir is one of rugby's most recognizable personalities. And after being diagnosed with MND in 2017, he was driven to help fellow sufferers and fund research into this incurable disease. His vision was a simple one. He wanted a world free of MND. Unfortunately, Doddy is no longer with us, but we continue to keep his dream alive. 550 miles in 48 hours, including all stops. This is no mean feat. We had to earn our sleep, earn our breaks, because there was definitely no delay for the start of the match. Three, two, one. Scotland! <laughs> Ultimately, we're a bunch of amateurs, riding in the middle of winter. This is an extraordinary challenge taken on by ordinary people. Are back, but this time we're doing a challenge with a purpose, aren't we, Mark? We are indeed. It is early doors at the Principality Stadium. For those not on British soil, this is Cardiff, Wales, the capital, and we're going to Edinburgh. Yeah, and this time I'm not actually wearing GCN kit. No, um, I've actually gone and got myself some Doddy Aids tartan. What do you think? It's, uh, well, I don't know. I'm sure GCN viewers are going to have a strong opinion on this Lycra. I mean, it's divisive, but I have to say, it really sort of strikes quite an image when you've got a peloton of what's going to be 200 riders going through the British countryside dressed like this. Yeah, and it's not just us starting at Principality. We're heading 555 miles towards Edinburgh to Murrayfield, which is kind of the home of Scotland rugby, isn't it? Yeah, yeah exactly. So five years ago, Rob Wainwright, that guy, um, approached me and said, look, shall we do something for his great late friend, Doddy Weir, to raise money for research and to look after those who are suffering with motor neuron disease? And he said, why don't we carry the match ball for the big rugby match between Scotland and England between the stadiums, between Edinburgh and London? And I said, great, what could possibly go wrong? Middle of February, 500 miles in two days, sounds great. And uh, we did that, there was four or five riders. And now look at it, there's 200 riders here today. And we got Hank involved, which is pretty exciting. Here's to what's gonna be an epic ride. I'm looking forward to it. And just like that, we are underway. A sea of bright yellow and blue tartan spread across the Welsh countryside. I was excited, nervous, and determined. 
This is a challenge that means more to me than any other. I have a personal connection to this horrific disease and I am determined to do my bit. Well, we finally escaped Cardiff. It was a bit of a rammy, but uh, rather than having angry toots of horns with this peloton, it was actually lots of uh, encouragement, lots of people sort of waving and peeping away, and it shows that the message has got out. And this peloton that's now snaking its way up through Wales and England and Scotland has really captured the hearts and minds of so many people. The firefighters were out there clapping us past, the school kids coming out. Early days, early days, but it's a great feel in the peloton so far. One thing to be said from uh, bike riders teaming up with rugby players is that they, uh, they cut a good shape. Uh, a peloton of uh, rugby riders, it really is a scrum. <laughs> and little Hankmeister here, look at him. I'm the smallest of the lot, what's going on? <laughs> Tuck, tucked in behind some of these prop forwards. I saw you this morning riding with Mr. Rob Wainwright, ex Scotland rugby captain, British Lion. What's it like teaming up with these rugby guys? We've got a big engine. I feel like we've got proper, the brotherhood. I feel like, you know, I feel in the trenches with uh, some, some pretty big burly men, which is, no bad thing, I feel safe actually, it's good. Why are we at a rugby pitch, I hear you ask, on an epic journey from Cardiff to Edinburgh? And it all stems from this jersey here and the tartan livery. It's all for Doddy, who was a massive rugby player, um, ended up getting MND, motor neuron disease, and raised insane amount of money. There isn't a cure for MND and there needs to be. So we're raising as much funds as, as humanly possible. So I'm not wearing my usual Castelli kit. I've been given one of the charity jerseys and uh, Doddy was pretty loud character. Um, he unfortunately passed away. Uh, last year, so uh, it's all in aid for him really and Rugby was a big passion of his hence why we're riding the Six Nations ball from Cardiff to Edinburgh and we're all wearing this very bright kit um, Which is actually quite nice because at the moment it's not a challenge that me or my mark are doing and we're not making You know, it's not about us It's about a much bigger picture and so many people on this ride have got incredible stories of why they're doing such an epic challenge, but for me, it's important to, to you know, do my bit and, um, and I hope I can do that by raising some funds. Anyway, from rugby pitch, the sun is going down and then we are through into the night shift, which is gonna be pretty long, I reckon. Anyway, back to the riding. The reception we got wherever we went was unbelievable and it really kept all of our spirits nice and high. And just like that, we're in the night shift. <laughs> the sun's gone down, the mood is still good in the camp. And uh, yeah, it's quite nice going back into night riding. Ross still here, the temperature's dropped, but we're still going. Big Martin Johnson, leading us up the KOM. Quick update, Mr. Wainwright. Where are we? How have you got on? Uh, 55 miles in? Yeah, possibly a touch more. We're a new town rugby club. It's, it's dinner time. Yeah. And uh, it's got cold, time. isn't it? It's it's pretty chilly. It's, what is it? We've done 10 hours and 30 minutes. 10 hours 30 minutes, so uh, yeah. we're getting good. We're tapping away, aren't we? We've only got we're 400 tapping. miles left. Yeah. The spirits are really high. We've yeah. managed our nutrition. We've kept together. We've worked as teams. And uh, now we need some grub. And some nice hot food. Fuel up, fuel up. Let's yeah. fuel up. Let's go. Sure. See you on the road. As the night drew in and the temperature plummeted, the 30 miles to our next stop for the night was a real struggle. So that's end of day one. 
Good old Martin Johnson sticking it in the big ring up the top there. <laughs> it is cold. Now uh, it's time for a quick kip and then back on the road in the morning. 180 miles done. Ah, uh, yeah. Not warm. And good morning. 5 a.m. 180 miles in. Long way to go. Everyone's ready. Lights are on. Ball's ready. All right, about time we get going. 200 miles plus planned today. So, uh, another long day in the saddle. Ah, uh, yeah, let's go. Moon still shining bright. After an early start, breakfast was planned for us about 40 miles down the road at Wrexham Football Club. Some fast roads, a cold start, but ticking down the miles before sunrise. The sun brings a new day and two centuries ahead before the next proper stop. What more do you want? Let's go. Good to have Mr. Sir Chris Hoy joining the core group. What well a team, led by team captain. Good old Russ putting the front. But we seem to be stopped at a train station anyway. Um, Hopefully it will take a while. <laughs> <laughs> Still going strong though. Still loads of miles to go. We're slightly behind time, a couple of hours behind time. so. It looks like we might be missing our sleep or two. I'm just hoping we're not going to have to ride non-stop for the next 300 and something miles. Anyway, just keep pedaling. So, quite a way through now. It's 4.30 on our second day. Um, hit Tarlington and Ollie told me to get Crips, chips and chips and gravy. So, uh, apparently it's a Yorks thing. Anyway. Chips and gravy. Well, just what the doctor ordered. Another rugby field and plenty of rain. Perfect. Here we are. Into the night shift. Still rocking it. Into the Yorkshire hills. How are you finding the hills and dales? Gotta love them. Especially in the night. Tailwind. Quiet, could be worse. <laughs> Last day, we've got to get the ball to the match, and um, it's 12 o'clock, and we're basically riding through. Come on, team, let's go. More cycling to come, as if 370 miles wasn't enough. <laughs> let's go. Big stint done, <coughs> just arrived. How you feeling, Rob? Big stint done there. Yeah, brilliant, that was really, really yeah. good. We were actually flying along uh, the A1, and here we are at Anik. And Still um, a fair way to go, just under 100 miles, we, is it? Yeah, we've got um, 90, 91. 91. Brain is now beginning to cease to function. <laughs> Uh, right, let's get some food. So, um, we'll get some food. <laughs> we'll get a big welcome from the fine folk yeah. Anik who are up in the middle of the night looking after us. Yeah. There are people as crazy as we are. That is very reassuring. I can hear some Oop. bagpipes as well. <laughs> bagpipes? Oh, God. <laughs> Oh, 
450 miles in and uh, just under 100 miles to go. So I feel like we're on the home stretch. We're into Scotland, been welcomed with some bagpipes. What more do you want? Um, we're not in Scotland yet, are we? We're not in Scotland yet. <laughs> we're not in Scotland yet. Yeah, we're, we're under 100 miles though to go. Uh, and team's been cracking on nicely. Um, we picked up the pace uh, through Newcastle and making our way up north. Edinburgh is in sight, but we've still got a fair way to go and we've got some tired legs among us and um, little to no sleep for a few. So, I'm doing well, but the game is nearly there and uh, we've got the match balls, so we need to make it. And I've got some gruel to keep me going. Perfect. <laughs> So it's the morning and 70 miles from Edinburgh. The sun is coming up, beautiful sunrise. Managed to capture still loads of support as we get closer to Scotland. But there's nothing better than having a good sunrise. And then it rejuvenates you even though you're tired. You still feel like you've got that extra push. All good. And support from everywhere. It's been incredible. Oh, I love it. So good to have this guy back. What a hero. How are you feeling? What, 400 yeah, miles in? 400 miles plus. Still smiling. Still yeah, smiling. Still smiling. Yeah. I think we've got some tired legs there, but everyone's doing bloody good, so I uh, can't <laughs> complain. And there is the border. We are in Dunbar and what a welcome. Uh, so all the kids have come out to see the ball, see Rob support, what we're doing here. And the game is yet to commence this afternoon. So I think everyone's getting pretty excited about this big Scotland, Wales game. But uh, the ball is getting a lot of attention. So it's just so good to see everyone out and support it. I mean, what, what more do you want? But I'm knackered, shattered. As we roll into Edinburgh, the end was in sight. All of the pain seemed to leave our legs and the atmosphere took over. It took me back to Tour of Britain or riding toward Yorkshire. The crowds lined the streets. What a ride. What a ride. Wow, here we are! Murrayfield Stadium! Wow, what a ride. Everyone participating in this ride and the wider circle managed to raise an insane £700,000. Now that is the power of sport. There you go, we made it to Scotland, to Murrayfield, the home of rugby here in Scotland. We've delivered the ball, the match ball for the Scottish Wales game. The mission is complete. All for Doddy Weir and the m and Foundations. Amazing. And uh, I'm just so happy to be a part of it. If you enjoyed this video, hit that thumbs up button. And if not, just for the amazing sport everyone's uh, done for this incredible, incredible charity. And uh, not much else to say, except I'm getting a bit emotional. So I'm gonna see you guys later. And I can't wait to get in there and soak up uh, all the uh, atmosphere. Love you all. Wet. 
I'm wet. I'm wetter than a duck. Ooh. Tell you what, getting likes on YouTube is far harder nowadays. I'm about to head off on a 200 mile ride on a 200 pound bike. What sounded like a great idea back in a warm, dry GCN Megabase is now looking a lot less appealing. I'm preparing to set off at 5 a.m. from a dark, cold and very wet peak district in the middle of the UK and try and make it back to Bath before nightfall. This isn't just another attempt by my GCN colleagues to test my endurance. We did genuinely want to see how a budget bike would fare on an epic ride. And as luck would have it, or not, we have some epic weather to deal with as well. Soaked within the first 20 minutes. And that's never good for any big ride, let alone such a long one as this. So I'm hoping I can punch through this cloud, but the weather is said to be headwind the whole way and a lot of rain. I mean, a lot of rain. About an hour in, 15 miles down. This is the wettest I've been in a very long time. And to think I've got around about 14 hours to go. I mean, I'm not going to lie. This is not what I want to happen. Just 25 miles in on the main East Road. It's been a bit of an adventure so far. Started at 5.30, it's been pouring rain, absolutely pouring it down. Headwind, relentless climbing through the lakes, and a puncher. But I'm gonna grab some breakfast. And while I do so, I'm gonna rewind the clocks so you can find out how on earth I got here, why GCN set me up to this, and how I got hold of a 200 pound bike. <laughs> Before my next challenge, I enlisted in the help of Alex because I need a little bit of advice on what bike to buy. So here's Alex. All right. All right, you ready, buddy? Um, let me park my bike up. Yeah. It's always difficult buying a bike secondhand, but I'm hoping Alex has all the answers. Okay, all right, talk to me. I've got a challenge. 200 miles on a 200 pound bike. I need to purchase one and then I need to ride it. But the first step is purchasing. Can you help me? 200 miles? Well, I can do it kilometers, I guess. Ah, it feels like a cop out of that, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, okay, so 200 pounds, we can rule out new bikes, can't we? First things we should immediately gravitate to, I think eBay, Facebook Marketplace, maybe even local newspapers or um, cycling groups, you know, local shops, clubs, some bike shops have secondhand stuff, so you've got quite a few options. I mean, that Saphir is massive. Go to for ease, simplicity, and the reach of what you get. I think you've got to go online. I think yeah. Facebook Marketplace would be the place to start for me. Okay, Facebook Marketplace. And then what am I trying what am I trying to put into the search box? So I would literally just be searching small road bike. So I'm riding through the peaks, so I'm hoping for an 11 speed bike. <laughs> you know, if you get an 11 speed bike, I'll be amazed. Why? But I think. Well, you have, that's not going to fit into the budget. Really, the most important things that come to mind are making sure that you're not buying something that's damaged or has got really worn out components. Right, okay, I think I got it. So I've got my work cut out. Yeah. I'll see you back in the office, hoping I've purchased a bike that is going to survive. Well, I was hoping you and might have got me a coffee. Wow. Well. Here we are, we've come all the way to Oxford because I've just met online, well, on Facebook Marketplace, NASA, who is whole kind of treasure trove of, of bikes. And uh, what do you do? How come you've, you've had so many uh, bikes? I was told by one of our fellow villagers about a year and a half ago. Yeah. Look, if you have a bike problem, come to me right and take it to the shops. If it's cheap, buy a bottle of wine and we drink it together. Yeah. If it's over like 10 or 12, 20 pounds, I charge you a discounted prices and it, money goes all to charity. I thought that's a good idea. Keep me busy. Now yeah, I have okay. spotted. <laughs> okay. This is going to be absolutely perfect for the challenge. And I think this is the one that we might shake hands over and hopefully I'll be riding this 200 miles. See how far 
I, I get on it, really. But for now, Nassim, thank you so much for your time. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank it was a pleasure you. to meet you, Ed. It's lovely to meet you, too. <laughs> uh, why has it got trifles on it? Oh. This is my new bike. <laughs> Where's the cover for the shifter? It's a giant Alux. SL, meaning super light. It's got the you know what you're talking the, about the you? tri bars, which is kind of that's kind of what allured it to me at first, in the first place. Because I'm thinking I'm doing 200 miles on this. I feel sorry for you. Yeah. One of the most important things I think is to get a bike that fits you. And when you're buying secondhand, you want it to make sure you're buying the right size because you can't change the size of the bike. You can replace the components, but also to make sure that the stuff isn't damaged or worn out. Good points to you for buying a bike which looks to be in good condition. Good set of wheels on a bike really help the performance of it. And in terms of the gears, well, we've got Shimano, reputable brand. It's sort of their sort of like entry level stuff. This is gonna need addressing first. What's going on with this? Back brake feels okay. Front brake will be okay once we've adjusted it. Little cover. Oh, it's got a carbon fork. Oh, no way. Yeah, there you go. The, I'm concerned by the size, but I think generally the bike, we've got the tiniest little bit of easy maintenance jobs, which most people should be able to do. Um, if you're unsure about maintenance jobs, maintenance book is what people should check out. One thing I wanted to do was thinking about slamming it. There's loads of spaces here, which we can flip and put on the top. All I need to do at home is to change pedals into my own pedals. Yeah. And I'm gonna change the saddle just because I'm going to ride a saddle I'm used to because mm. riding 200 miles, that's, you know, you don't want 15 to be hours. Comfortable, do you? All right, let's get to it. You've joined me post breakfast and the rain has stopped. I hope I don't talk too soon. And now you must be caught up. No! There we have it. You say when you buy cheap, you buy twice. Second punch of the day. I only bought one extra tube. So now I've got to try and figure out how to sort this one out. This is not good. This is really not good. Let's hope I can fix this and get back on the bike because otherwise I'm in for a hell of a long day. How do you lose all your energy, Hank? Um, well, I had to pump eight punches up. Let's get packed up. Let's get on the bike. And let's see how far I can get without another puncher. Never give up. Never give in. No matter how much is against you. I'll tell you what, no matter what bike you're on, doing a long endurance ride across the country like this, it's amazing what kind of adventure it takes you on. You've got to be spontaneous and you've, you've got to just take the plunge because just running through a farmyard, met a nice farmer, running up a farm track. Yes, I'm on a 200 quid bike. It weighs a ton. 25 mil, barely get up it, but yet I think for me that's what adventure's all about. Doesn't matter what bike you're riding, it just means getting out, no matter what the weather, wind, rain or shine, and just take it for what it is, 10 miles at a time. I've hit Tamworth, 85 miles in, and to be honest, I've just given up on these tyres. I'm just getting continuous punches. So I've gone and bought some cheapest, the cheapest tires I could find. I bought them for 60 quid, which is close to my budget. But anyway, I think it's gonna get me out. <laughs> I had to get cool it. So I've been so lucky in my career to ride some of the best bikes money can buy. But this has really done a an incredible job nonetheless. Yes, it's more sluggish. Yes, it's harder on the climbs. Yes, the wheels aren't so good. It's not so stiff, it's not so light. But having said all that, it's doing the job. I'm 100 miles in, all I've changed is the tires. So whatever your budget, a budget shouldn't stop an adventure. 
I guess rather the opposite. It makes an adventure. I'm saying all this, but still 100 miles to go. And a lot more rain to push through. And a lot more hard, grippy roads to forge through. So, I guess I should check back with you in a few more miles. So here we are, how on earth did I get here? We're in Sirencester and uh, well, I had multiple punches in my wheel and bought in all the water. And as much as I tried to fix it, I just couldn't fix it with patches. So I managed to wave down a car and I jumped basically 15 miles to Sirencester to a bike shop, which was actually closed, but I asked the owner, Dave Evans, to open it so he could give me an inner tube so I can get back on my way. So 40 miles to go, but I did miss 15 miles by catchy lift, which I guess is cheating, but I had no other choice. Every single bike shop was closed and I couldn't fix the puncture. So there's not much I could do. Anyway, back on the bike, torrential rain. What more do you want in life? Let's go. I'm back on the bike and back into a lot of rain and a big headwind. 40 miles to go. Let's go. We're straight all the way to the main road. Through Oaksey, 165 miles on the clock. If only I had a rowing boat, I probably would have got there quicker. Whew. The bike's definitely starting to get heavy and I can feel every single incline. Five miles to go, and I'm really battling into a headwind now. It's a real test of your mind power when you've been soaking wet for five hours, well, since 5 a.m., and you go past your home with 25 miles to go. Now I've just got to fight on. So here we are. I've made it to Bath, the iconic Crescent. I managed to ride from Hathersage in the Peak District on a 200 pound bike I got off the internet. I've got to say, I've had an amazing time. Actually, no, I haven't. It's been tough. It's been torrential rain. I've had multiple punctures. I'm freezing cold. And the worst of it all is I aim to do 200 miles and I've done 195 miles. I'm ending the ride now. I'm not going any further. I'm not wanting to do the extra five miles just for the sake of it because I'm so cold. I've been riding since 5 a.m. I've averaged 17 miles an hour. I've got a ride time of 11 hours. And to be honest, I'm ready for bed. The one thing I am gonna say though, is I did have to hitchhike from Borton on the Water to Sirencester, 15 miles. So I did get in the car for that. So take it or leave it. You can't win them all. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I hope you've enjoyed watching me suffer. I've survived. The bike survived. And i got to say a massive thank you for you guys to watching. Let me know in the comment section below if you would try something mad like this. Anyway, I'm absolutely freezing. So I'm going to go and get warm now. I'm going to attempt to qualify for the Gravel World Championships. Yep, you heard me. Can an ex-pro track cyclist qualify to race at the World Championships? How hard can it be? Well, I'm going to find out. And it's probably going to be very hard. A few months ago, I wanted to set myself a challenge, something that will get me motivated. And whilst I was searching for an event to do, someone at GCN Megabase said, Manon, why don't you try it and qualify for the Gravel World Championships? Do you know what? I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. Now that I decided what my aim was, I needed to find a qualifying event. There are races all over the world, from France, Poland, US and Australia, that riders can take their pick from 
that are part of the Gravel World Series. There are 17 races in total, but I've chosen to do this race in Denmark. Why did I choose this one? Well, there's only one reason because it was the flattest. It's 160 kilometers long and it is a pan flat course. I'll be honest, after completing the steamboat gravel race in Colorado, 224 kilometers at altitude, I thought this was gonna be a walk in the park. So now that I've chosen my event, it's time to get the hard work and the training in. And if you wanna know how I trained for this event, then there's gonna be a whole video coming on everything I did to the channel very soon. So we have touched down in Denmark. We actually arrived last night. I've picked up my Argon 18 bike for the race, which is an absolute beauty, but I will show you that later. But we're just on the way to the race now. I'm gonna sign on this afternoon, get on my number, get everything prepped. We're feeling quite scared and nervous. We're not far out from the race and it is very flat and very windy. Possibly the windiest place I've ever been. The trees are like on the slant. Okay, so I've arrived at the start area and this is the expo. There's a few different stalls going on, but I'm gonna go and sign on now. I'm not taking my hood down because it is so windy and quite cold. So this is gonna be me. <laughs> is this where I sign, um, get my start? Oh, cool. Um, I am number 364. I wasn't expecting it to be so windy. It is pretty windy. I yes, <laughs> not used to this. A little bit more, more or less tomorrow. Tomorrow, hopefully, yeah. Perfect, thank you very much. Okay, got my uh, start number in my little bag with some time and chips, number, and all the details. Now that's all left to do is get myself ready for the start tomorrow. Now you might be wondering what bike I'm using. Well, I'm on the Argon 18 Dark Matter, a pure racing machine and the perfect bike for the job. Now this bike has got a lot of cool equipment on it. I've got the Hunt 42 Limitless Aero Gravel wheels, got Pirelli tires, and you might have also noticed that I have suspension. Yes, I've got the Redshift Pro shock stem and seat post, and hopefully that is gonna smooth out all the bumps so I'm not gonna get any fatigue in my upper body because that is something that I have struggled with. So hopefully it's gonna be nice and smooth on the gravel. But if you wanna find out all about this bike in a lot more detail, then head over to the GCN Tech channel where I've done a video on all my equipment, my nutrition, my clothing, everything that you need to know. The course is three laps of just over 50 kilometers long and the course has a little bit of everything in it. You kind of start on gravel, you go to the coast, you hit really loose sand, then you're on the beach and it's really hard compact sand. And then you go into the woods where there's just loads and loads of gravel tracks. And I've never actually, I've never been to Denmark before, but the gravel riding out here is actually really good. Okay, so it's less than 24 hours to the race now. I've signed on, I've got my numbers. I hope I'm ready, but this is possibly the windiest place I've ever been, but also the most beautiful place I've ever been. The sand is so white. I just wish the sun was shining and it was less windy. That would make it even better. So it's now time for my pre-race meal. And of course I've gone for the classic spaghetti bolognese. Can't go wrong with that. But this afternoon I was actually planning on going out and doing a bit, little bit of a recon of the course or some of it, but I feel pretty bunged up, which I'm actually quite gutted about doing all this prep and then getting to race and not feeling 100%. But there's nothing I can do about it now. So I'm just gonna put my big girl boots on and crack on with it as best as I can. Just gonna eat this and have an early night and hopefully I'll feel a little bit better in the morning. So, just got to the start and I didn't think it was gonna be raining, but it has been pouring down overnight. It is freezing cold, but thankfully the guys at Argon 18 have let me stand and get a bit of shelter underneath their tent. But yeah, I was not expecting it to be this cold. But yeah, not long, but half an hour till the start now. So might go and do a little bit of a warm up, but not sure how warm I'm going to get in this weather. Ooh, I'm a little bit scared, but also nervous. All the emotions. Why do I do this to myself? <laughs> start line always feels a little bit nervous and I always get like flashbacks when I was racing. Everybody looks very professional. 
I feel like I've entered a pro race. I mean, there is quick step pros doing it, so it pretty much is a pro race. <laughs> so I'm at the start line and I'm gridded in the first top 25. Don't know if that's a good thing or not. Um, around a lot of pro riders, which is quite scary, but I think the start is going to be absolute carnage. There's like nearly a thousand riders behind me. Probably going to overtake me, but yeah, wish me luck. Hope to see you out there. So the start was neutralised and once the neutralised car pulled off we hit this really loose gravel and it's kind of like gravel that I've never really experienced before it was almost like just chipping stones so it's just lots of really loose stones absolutely everywhere and because it had rained a lot the night before and the morning of the race there was just massive puddles of rain everywhere and you couldn't quite figure out how deep the puddle was when you hit it so that was quite scary. I thought this is a really long race I'm not going to get carried away like I have done in the past so I kind of like rode at my own tempo quite a few riders overtook me and then I kind of settled into my own pace. We didn't go onto the beach immediately but we hit quite a sandy section it was kind of in the dunes and then we hit the beach. Just on the beach section now on my word. It was basically like Battle on the Beach, but 160 kilometres of it. Especially when you've got nearly a thousand riders all coming to this one section. It's probably wide enough for two riders. We had to get off and walk, so there was a little bit of, of walking involved. I've never been so sandy, muddy and gritty in my life. It was literally everywhere. I think I had half the beach in my mouth at one point. And I'm so glad I had glasses on because my eyes would have been destroyed. So it was about 25 kilometres into the race and we hit this really long straight gravel road that seemed to go on for absolutely ages. Oh my God. Oh, the wheel. And I just couldn't hold the wheel. Riders were coming past me. I was dropping the wheel and I felt like I was giving everything but my legs were just going backwards. So that was um, a little bit um, heartbreaking. So all your effort was going in, but you just couldn't keep up. Story of my life, really. But I have to say, um, because I rode the redshift stem and seat post, I felt such a big difference when I hit the really bumpy stuff. Like my arms or upper body did not hurt one bit. I never felt like it was too bumpy. And some of the roads were really bumpy. There was like proper da 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 not sure what da -da 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 is, but it was pretty bumpy and I could see no riders around me like their whole upper body was shaking but mine actually felt, felt pretty smooth so then we hit another part of the beach and it was a really long straight section and to get onto the beach we had to go through quite a lot of loose sand and I know my sand riding skills and it's not very good so I got off and I did a little bit of a run until I hit the hard sand there was a rider that came past me and literally went head over heels because his front wheel just hit the deep, deep sand and face full of sand. So I'm glad that wasn't me at least, yeah. So a little run and then onto the beach, which was a really, really windy section and it felt like it went on for a long time. And then there was riders coming past me and saying, you know, come and get, get on my wheel, get out the wind. I was trying to get on the wheel but I just couldn't stay on the wheels which was yeah not good for the morale let's say that at this point I was really feeling it I felt like I'd done well over 100 kilometers when really I'd only just done over 50 kilometers and I had my head down I was just pedaling getting on with it and I missed the turn I don't know what to say this is not going to plan I've just had to stop because I somehow went the wrong way because I'll be honest, I was just f***ed and my head was down and I missed the turning. So, um, yeah, but I feel like poop. I 
I don't really like quitting. <sighs> okay, so I've just come to a stop. I am 72 kilometers in and I'll be honest, I don't know if I can carry on. I have nothing left in the tank. I just feel like I'm going backwards the whole time. And it feels like I'm swallowing razor blades. <sighs> Everything in me is like, I should carry on and just get around. But then I'm like, I'm just gonna put myself in a hole because I feel absolutely awful. It is a really tough decision to make because you're like, oh, I'm, like, I'm going to be a failure and this and that. And then I'm like, no, like, I wasn't feeling great. I put myself on the start line. I gave it my all. I, I just couldn't do it. And I think it's really important to show this on video because a lot of our videos, especially I've done in the past, where I've done events and they've gone quite well and you kind of, you know, you can finish the events and it's all rainbows and sunshine. Whereas this kind of happens every now and again. And I think it's really important to show that because it doesn't, things don't always go to plan and that's okay because that's just life. One thing that definitely didn't hold me back though was my equipment. I just want to say a big thank you to Argon 18, Hunt and Redshift for being involved in this video because I definitely can't fault anything on that bike. This time it was just me and my legs. So the top eight male finishers were all Danish and that kind of shows you have to be a true Danish Viking to do well in this race. The winner of my race was Tessa Nafis from Live Collective Racing that did it in a rapid time of five hours and nine minutes. But out of all the starters in my age category, only 17 finished the race. It wasn't only me that was struggling with the brutal conditions today. And even current Sudar Quickstep pro Casper Asgreen could only finish 27th after suffering a tubeless valve problem as well. So to answer your question, no, I didn't qualify for the Gravel World Championships. And turns out, it's actually really hard to qualify. But if you did enjoy this video, make sure to give it a big thumbs up. Let me know what you thought of it down in the comment section below, even though it didn't go to plan and I most definitely didn't qualify for the World Championships. But if you want to find out more about my bike, head over to the GCM Tech channel where I have done an in-depth look at everything on the bike. But now I'm going to find some Strepsil, some Lemsip and get him to bed and probably stay there for the next few days. <laughs> it's go time. 4am alarm was worth it. We're all set. We're packed. We're ready. We're heading to the start line. We're about to take on Unbound 200. I'm so excited. It's going to be mega. I'll see you later. Okay. <laughs> all right. Good Have a good ride. Cheers. <laughs> Enjoy the day. Nice. Yeah, you too. Thank you. Okay, yeah, take it easy. <laughs> 200 miles of gravel awaits. I'm in America at arguably the biggest gravel race in the world, Unbound 200, and I'm lining up with the pros. Thanks to Alchemy, Reynolds and Redshift, I've been set up with a dream gravel bike to take this beast on. I'm nervous, I'm really excited, and I'm also very naive and apprehensive because I've got no idea what's ahead of me. Can I get a cheeky result or will this turn into a battle of survival? I guess there's only one way to find out. 
This year's edition of Unbound is 205 miles long with 9,100 feet of climbing. It's known for its tire slicing flint, heavy mud if there's a sniff of rain, punchy climbs and rocky gullies. Starting and finishing in Emporia, Kansas, the route takes one big anti-clockwise loop on mostly gravel roads. There are two points for water refills and two checkpoints where you can receive help from a support crew. Outside that, you're on your own. And I've actually managed to rustle up the best support crew going in the form of my dad. Thanks, Dad. If you yeah. can, try and find some lube. What sort of lube? Any lube. Any lube. Anything. And this is the setup I've gone for. Alchemy have sent me their Lycos frame set. Out of Colorado, Alchemy are known for their custom handmade titanium and carbon frame sets. The Lycos is actually their first production model, which retains all the quality that they're known for, but brings the bike to a more affordable price point. Reynolds decked me out with their top spec gravel orientated black label ATR wheel set. Perfect for what's ahead on this route. The beauty of them are is that they're designed to be run on road, gravel or both. Redshift completed the build with their Shock Stop Pro Suspension Stem. And this is something I'm really gonna need to rely on because in a recent FKT attempt, my arms were totally shot. So I need this for the comfort in my upper body, which I really believe is gonna to translate to extra speed. I've completed the bike with 45 mil wide tires. Wider the better, in my opinion. I've gone for inserts. Enough sealant to sink an army of elephants and two small bags here and there for my food and spares. Total weight, 9.4 kilos of this bike, so light enough to really rock on in Unbound. And it's got a banging paint job too, so I'm gonna get the duster out and you can enjoy that. While I leave it there and get ready for race day. Ha ha, come on everyone. Whilst I give the bike a bit of a polish off, don't forget you can head over to the GCN Tech Channel now get a much deeper dive into everything I've used, kit, bike, equipment, hydration, nutrition, to get me through Unbound, because it has been one heck of a planning mission. So there we go, made it to the start line. About 10 minutes and then we're all off. Feel rather competitive, being right at the front with the pros. Bit of an update, the start was absolutely unreal. So cool, so good to be back. Just went straight into that like bunch race mode. Loving it, sun rising, chipping away. And then we've just hit the mud of doom. I've never seen mud like it in my life. Most people just running with their bikes. Um, I'm having to kind of run on the grass, otherwise your wheels just gum up. I've had this broken, kind of nearly broke my chain, got jammed, stopped and got that done. Even the, even the motor can't get through it. That's what it's all about though. And I'm definitely getting to the finish. It could turn into a bit of a, bit of a battle to get there at this rate. 20 miles in over two hours at the start of this race. It's just insane. But this is what it's all about. Unbound.
So this has turned into a different sort of race than I was expecting. Reassessing the goals a little bit and trying to keep on plodding on. Make it to the finish now, I'll be happy. Welcome to the Unbound Bike Wash. So I've just been washing down the bike and I need to do it because it's been so grimed up and I've just got in there, got as much of the mud off as possible. Hopefully things go a bit smoother after that one, but <laughs> I'm thankful for this river. Oh, this race, <sighs> been harder than I thought it would be, not gonna lie. About a quarter of the way in now, 50 miles, just passed through the first water oasis. My body is absolutely shot already, mainly just from that muddy sector where I was carrying my bike and heaving it through the mud. <laughs> it was like being on the set of Ninja Warrior. Like a muddy ninja warrior. Wow, big first experience of gravel. Oh, little Eureka moment. I'm looking for the checkpoint where my dad's gonna be with some much needed water, food, and then try and get back on the bike, hit the road. That's been a wild ride so far. Fuck, I need loads of chain lube. We don't, I think I forgot to pack the chain lube. Huh? I think I forgot to pack chain lube. Oh, you need it. I really need some. Okay, I need a... Oh, I need my, uh, my I need a hydration pack filled up, Dad. Thank you. Cheers for that. Yep. Thanks. thanks. Um, right, we'll keep on going. Yeah, you're doing good. Um, okay, I'll see you in a bit. Okay? Your bag's okay? Yeah. Okay, all the best. Okay. Take care, okay? Yeah. Look after yeah. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll see you in a bit. Yeah. Go for a rough patch. Feel uh, pretty crap actually. Not sure what happens because felt good going to the checkpoint. And then as soon as I got going again, I just got a headache and feel just really rubbish. Just like this real big cramp in my stomach. Starting to really realize how tough this event is. Met a guy called Paul who's kind of got me out on his wheel and then um, taught me around a bit. So good for morale just to ride with him. I want to get going, get with him again, because he was like, he was proper optimistic. I had a real tough moment, just like felt sick and uh, stomach cramps and the heat just getting on me. So I'm here, uh, I'm, uh, I'm in the pain cave now, but I'm uh, committed. So my next thing is just get into the water oasis. Keep rolling. All right. Cheers, thank you. Yeah, 
can't hold the camera anymore. I'm uh, really, really bad. Run out of water, mouth's dry. Feel so, so ill. Just hoping I can make it. The oasis should be here any, any second now. I'm in, in, yeah, in bad way. I'm not sure I can make it to uh, the oasis. I'm starting to get a bit scared. Can't find the oasis. I've had to stop under the shade. And um, I'm being a bit, a bit of a bad way, actually. I think, uh, I think I'm going to have to call it in, unfortunately, guys. I'm genuinely uh, a little scared of continuing like this. Can't drink the mix of my bowls. And uh, I've got no water. I'm going to have to put some f***ing mix on my head. Oh, I'm not finishing. I'm not letting this beat me. Fucking not. I'm not bowing out of this one. Okay, Connor, what did you say? See if we can make it. I think we've been in worse states before. Come on, Connor. Can't get up. Come on. Come on, 7k. 7k, that's what the man said. Here we go. Oh, it's rain. I feel the rain. Make it until it happens. I'm just like starting to be on the edge of throwing up. Thank you, man. Thanks. I really appreciate that. Okay. Get to the oasis. Yeah, I'm gonna try. Oh. Somehow I've made it to the feed station. Well, I'll tell you why I've made it because everyone in this race is so kind. It's just insane. Um, everyone's asking me how I was doing, trying to give me some water, and this absolute legend of a man came to the feed station, rode back with a bottle of water, and gave me a sip. So thank you so much for that. Because honestly, uh, I was um, about to just curl up in a ball in the hedge and call an ambulance. I've had about 10 Doritos, packets, water, which was like drinking nectar from the gods. I'm feeling like I can get back on my bike. 120k to go, 80 miles to go. Fucking riding again. See you guys. Thanks for seeing See ya. <laughs> 
I'm on my bike, in a bin bag, riding into a thunderstorm on the Kansas Prairie. So, of all the dumb things I've done in my life, this one is definitely up there. But I've got a big smile on my face. It feels good to be moving again. I'm getting to that finish, even if it means I have to wear a bin bag. Jesus. Jesus, you're doing well. Thanks. I'll take my time with this stop. There's okay. no rush. Oh. Do you need anything? I'm all good, hang. Let me get the camel bag off you. Um, Unzip your camel bag. You're the cop. I must admit, I didn't think it would be this savage. I knew it would be savage, but this is next level. Outrageous. In a bit, okay? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Soaking up the last 30 miles. Got pizza in my pocket. Got water in my bottles. Got mud on my face. <laughs> Got mud on my legs. Got mud up my bottom. Got mud in my ears. <laughs> and I've got a bush in my head. Oh my jeepers. <laughs> right, I'm gonna enjoy my little sunset walk. Jump back on my saddle. Finish this bad boy off. My badass, ridiculous, insane, crazy, awesome event and race I think I've ever done. I've made it to the outskirts of Emporia. <laughs> I'm gonna do it. Last little climb up through the university now. And then it's the finish line. Last mile or so. Highland Hill to go. And then we're home and dry. <laughs> That's some feeling. <laughs> That's honestly been one of the most mental days 
of my life. There we go, 200 miles, a lot of mud. Thank you. I thought I was done, done at one point. That is what it's all about. That was some sight, some feeling. I'm gonna savour it now. Unbound. Wow. Bring it home. Great job to Connor too. From Germany, from Apple Tour. Germany! Great job to Hello, man. You're right. Oh. What on earth have I just been through? <laughs> 17 hours, 11 minutes. Little, uh, little behind schedule for what I predicted. <laughs> I did not think I'd make it at one point. I thought I was really, really dumb. And so I made it home, finishing second last in 85th position in the Elites. A long way from the front with a whole heap of mad respect for what those who are up there are capable of. But what an experience. And to have Dad there made it even more special. In fact, it was the people that ultimately made this race so unforgettable. The camaraderie, spirit and community without which I definitely wouldn't have made it home. To all who shared the road with me at some point, thank you for getting me to the finish. Big thanks too to Alchemy Reynolds and Redshift for getting on board and helping get me to the start line to begin with. The Tour de Station Ultimate 1000. One ride, 1000 kilometers long, 26,000 meters of elevation, the equivalent of three times up and down Mount Everest, this is, without doubt, the most painful ride I've ever done. As you aim to cycle every major pass in Switzerland in a single, stunningly beautiful, but ridiculously tough ride. Well, in the last 28 hours, I've had 45 minutes sleep. Having never done anything longer than 380 kilometers, about seven months ago, I decided that this would be a good idea. Can I complete it? Only one way to find out. This, this is, this is ridiculous. This is definitely the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. I'm struggling to hold my head up. It's like my neck muscles have gone. My knees hurt. My lower back hurts. My shoulders and neck hurts. And I'm just f For the longest five kilometers of my life. Previously on GCN, you may recall Connor and I taking on the Tour de Station on separate occasions. The standard event, a 250 kilometer route taking on the height of Everest, is absolutely savage on its own. It destroyed both of us and I had a spectacular bonk on the final climb. However, the organizers have invited us back for more and have two new, even harder events. I've never done anything this hard or this long with this much climbing, but I want to find out what I'm made of. This is the route. Throughout it, there are reboot stations where you can sleep and get support. Support elsewhere on the course is forbidden, so this event is semi-supported. If you want a shorter challenge, there's also the 555 km route, the original Tour de Station, and some shorter Grand Fondo options, all set in the beautiful Valais region of Switzerland. This beautiful bike I'm riding is a Trigon AR, AR standing for all round, which is ideal because I'm riding all around Switzerland as quickly as possible. 
We've also got these beautiful Reynolds Black Label 46 Pro Disc Brake Wheels. Absolutely superb, the latest top of the range wheels from Reynolds, which are also helping supporters in this event. They weigh just 1397 grams a pair. Now I've got a full video of the bike and kit set up over on GCN Tech, so be sure to check that out. There's loads of useful information in there about the bike setup and the kit choice for ultra events like this, and I explain the choices I've made. I'm on the start line. I'm off in about five minutes. I'm nervous, but I'm excited. This is by far the longest thing I've ever done. It's to give some context, but the longest ride I've done before was 380 kilometers. This is way more than that. Can I complete it? There's only one way to find out. And now on stage, I call riding for GCN, Oliver Bridgewood. This is it, the first climb, heading up to Chante Lac, climb I've done before in Gravel Epic, and uh, well, it's a beautiful little ski resort at the top. It's it's uh, known as Little Canada. Now this route is incredible, and I can't wait to show it to you because it goes through some of the most beautiful places on Earth uh, in Switzerland. When we get around like Grindelwald and stuff, and the Gotthard Pass, it's unbelievable. One of the things that appealed to me about this event as well, as the amazing scenery, is the semi-supported nature of it. So, ultra endurance events, they're going from strength to strength. They're getting more and more popular. You know, things like the Transcontinental and the Race Across America and stuff. But with the Transcontinental, it's, it's a pretty big step because it's completely self-sufficient. Whereas, for me, this is, I guess, maybe something of a gateway drug to something like that. On the second climb, the Calder Lane. Now the bottom section of this, oh my days, so steep, pacing plan, just went out the window. I mean, I had to do about 250 watts just to get up here. It's that thing in it, you know, the best laid plan doesn't survive contact with the enemy. So, that's the example. The first reboot station is quite a jump. It's 180k, and it's at Idler, where the UCI are based. Uh, they, uh, Ironically, don't have any jurisdiction here. So, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna ride right past them. But at that reboot station, I'm planning to just take on some supplies, not have a proper stop. My plan, and it's, well, it might change. I'm gonna try and get to, uh, what's it called, Grindelwald, the third reboot station. And I'll have a sleep there, I think. I'll be like 24 hours riding. Nice. So, looking at the clock, we're about an hour from sunset. And then, I'm gonna be riding into the night. And, uh, well, in the mountains. I'm excited. Yeah, never done it before, but it's time for everything, isn't it? It's gonna be good. Yeah, I feel all right. It's gonna be uh, it's gonna be tough hitting it out, but yeah, we'll, we'll be all right. Right, crack on. Come on, well done. See you in a bit. Nice run. See you later.
I'm struggling a bit. Okay. My, uh, like, from on that climb after the first reboot, yeah. started to feel my right knee. Okay. And since then, it's just been like, oh, it's all I can think about. It's just my knee just hurts. Okay. And so, well, I'm gonna, I'm just limping, limping like, yeah. This whole like leg, I've just been limping. All right. And like people have just been like really being and coming past me. It's so demoralising. Okay. But like, um, I'm gonna just get to the reboot. The yeah. Reboot and just have a rest, get some food, have a proper stop there. Yeah. Have a little like sleep and stuff. Yeah. And then crack on. Yeah. But um, I stopped and like, move. I stopped and like dropped my saddle a little bit. Yeah. I think that's helping. Okay. But yeah, just so you're aware. You've had 45 minutes, just let me know. What? 45 minutes. Sweet. <coughs> this is, without doubt, the most painful ride I've ever done. Parts of me hurt that I didn't know could hurt. My wrists hurt. My knees hurt. My lower back hurts. My shoulders and neck hurts. And I'm just My tummy hurts too. With all the stuff I'm trying to eat. Oh man. This is... Oh, I'm not going to forget this one in a hurry. Oh, this is um, torture. It's just so much like different pain I'm experiencing. It's like aches like everywhere. Yeah, this is something else, this ride. Oh man. My plan changed. Rather than sleep in the day and ride through the whole night, I decided to try and push on to the Andermatt Rebu station and sleep there. I'll see you all in a bit. Bye. Catch you later. Bye. This climb we're on now is the Grosse Scheidegg and it's one of the most beautiful parts of Switzerland, this absolutely stunning valley. And to the right up here, when we get to the beautiful ski town of Grindelwald, you can see the Eiger and the north face of the Eiger on the right up here, imposing itself. Twenty-eight hours, about forty-five minutes sleep. I reached Andermatt and treated myself to some proper sleep, a luxurious 4.5 hours, with an alarm at 3am, but not before stuffing as many carbs as possible into my face. 
basically got into bed. Yeah, it was come sleep. Put an alarm on, and then was blacked out, and then the alarm alarm woke me up. So I definitely uh, definitely would get more sleep if I had not set an alarm. First climb and descent of the day done. Chilly, feeling better today after some actual sleep. And <coughs> there's an absolutely stunning cloud inversion coming off the climb. It's it's uh, dawn, so there's a little bit of light. Sun's about to come up. Oh, feeling much better. Still feel like I've ridden 500k though. <laughs> All things relative. All right, let's crack on. Oh yeah, like, honestly. That sleep, I mean that four and a half hour sleep I got. Jesus Christ, that's made so much difference. Um, so we're making good progress. Two big climbs now. Two of the biggest climbs in the event. Gotthard and Furka. I've done them before, I know them, they're beautiful. So I feel quite positive about them. Um, but they're monsters. And then it's it's kind of like long valley road descent sort of thing down to Visp. Visp's the goal, we'll get to Visp, then we'll get another good quality sleep in before we hit the final leg tomorrow. Just hitting the lower slopes of the San Gotthard Pass. Um, this is one of my favourites. It's a stunning pass. And one of the best things about it is it has very little traffic on it because there are actually two roads up the San Gotthard the one for cars, which is like a dual carriageway, and then the one we're about to turn off onto, which is the old road. You know you're in Switzerland because everything has order. Even the cobbles are really ordered and patterned like a, like a mosaic. So I, French cobbles, no, put them anywhere. Now, halfway up the Furka Pass, the highest, well, the summit is the highest point of the race, the 2,450 meters. It's a monster, this one, but I'm feeling good. The Furka Pass is pretty famous, if you don't know it. It was in the film Goldeneye, so you might have seen Sean Connery and his DB5 on here. Not Goldeneye, Goldfinger, sorry. Ooh. It's been a long day. And, um, also, it's been used in Grand Tours and the iconic photo on the Furka Pass on the other side where there's the uh, empty Hotel Belvedere on the corner. Whew.
But this, I set my alarm for just four hours sleep. This would give me a wake-up time of 11pm, with the aim of completing the final 260 kilometres and 9,000 metres of climbing in one big hit. I've just woken up. Oh, my God. Uh, I've... I've <laughs> oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a f- mess. Yeah, it's 2 a.m. We're 800 kilometers in and I'm in absolute agony. My back and my neck are killing me. I just, this is making me feel like I never want to ride a bike ever again. I just, I just gotta keep going. Sun's about to come up. I feel like it gives me a lift every time. It's third time now this has happened on this ride. That's absolutely that's nuts. Whew. Right, come on. Beat fuel. Lots of beat fuel. Ah, sorry man. There you Mega. Go. I arrived at the final reboost just seconds behind two other riders. I'd been gaining on them all day and now, with just 60 kilometres to go, I decided this had to be a quick stop. Just left the final rest station. I've got 53 kilometres to go and three all category uh, climbs left and I think I'm up into sixth place overall. I'm struggling to hold my head up. So that's why I'm look, looking down all the time. Cuz like my neck muscles have gone. I'm just wary of the time gap behind. I'd really like to hold on to my top 10 that I've currently got. I know there's riders close behind. I've got nightmares of this climb. When I did the event before, I got to the bottom of this climb and I was in 16th place. And then I lost 10 places on it. The lights went out and I just was getting past. And I, honestly, it's suffer nightmares. And I'm just worried that I'm going to do the same. Yeah, it's 400 metres. See it on my, on my Wahoo. They're not behind me, are they? I can't look behind me. Upon reaching the summit of the Quad I crossed the final timing mat, completing 1,012 kilometres with 26,900 metres of elevation in 71 hours and 54 minutes. And sixth place. My neck is All that remained was to descend to Verbier to the neutralised finish. You did it, buddy. You did it. That is without doubt the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. That is the hardest thing I've ever done. I've made it. And it was about well, several times 
where I never thought I was actually going to be able to finish this ride. So I'm kind of in a bit of shock, but... Oh. <laughs> I kind of lost the words. But yeah, big thanks to uh, the organisers of the Tour Station and uh, also to Trigon for a brilliant bike yeah. and Reynolds for the wheels because on either of them skip to beat. And um, also, like, if you want to give this video a thumbs up, don't do it for me. Do it for the amazing crew that have filmed this because they've had probably less sleep than I've had and uh, it wouldn't have been made without them and they were amazing and they helped me through it and I, I, don't, I wouldn't have got through it were it not for them so they're the unsung heroes <laughs> but yeah I'm going to go and have a sleep now for more than like three hours bye can we go where cars can't or where a ferry or a helicopter is advised the mission is, can we get to the most remote pub in the UK? My question is, who put a pub here? It's getting gnarlier and gnarlier. This is proper remote. This is a proper challenge, even though it's just a day. I mean, I can see why we got warned that this was, wasn't to be taken lightly. Still a long way to go, man. To the pub. Our journey starts here in Scotland, home to world record holder, but more importantly, good friend Mark Beaumont. The UK's most remote pub is located in Inverie, a small coastal town in the Scottish Highlands. And thanks to Yolio and Gore, we are headed there for a pint. To get there, we are taking a route we have never seen undertaken by bike, starting at Fort William and traversing through the legendary Noydark Peninsula. At only 75 kilometers, how hard can it be? We set off on the four hour journey up to Fort William, where our adventure would begin. We found a hotel and got some sleep ready for an early start. Chilly start in an early morning, isn't it, Mark? Yeah, I think the early start will pay off, though, mm. because uh, it's a bit of an unknown as to how long this is going to take. Um, so right now, we're by the sea. This is in the Highlands, on the beautiful west coast of Scotland, and this is Loch Eel. We've got the highest mountain in Scotland shrouded in cloud behind us. And the first bit looks pretty straightforward, following the Caledonian Canal as if we were heading up towards Inverness. But then after about 20k, head off into the rough stuff. And the Noidart Peninsula has quite a reputation. I've never been there before, so... Uh, I think we should get going. Yeah, it's gonna be a long day, and that's, I guess, why we've packed a lot on the bikes as well, because we just don't know how long it's gonna take us and if we're gonna be staying the night. So we've got bivy bag, sleeping bag, et cetera, et cetera. But more on that a little bit later, and it's about time we hit the road, the gravel. Let's do it. You got it. This is the start of a good adventure, isn't it, mate? No complaints. We've got a headwind, but uh, it's nothing. It's nothing, honestly. Noydark is legendary in Scotland, so, uh, you know, I can't help that this is uh, lulling us into a false sense of security. It's so utterly beautiful going up the Caledonian Canal 
this is not the sort of scenery where you want your bike computer beep, 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 beep at you. So we both turned our notifications off and uh, went in the wrong direction. <laughs> so can't blame our wahoos, but uh, they were screaming at us if, they, if we hadn't turned off notifications. But can you blame us? Look at it, absolutely great. This road happens to run out and we're now gonna have to do a U-turn. So um, yeah, there's a, there's a cautionary tale in there somewhere. Beautiful scenery, slightly distracting. We might have gone the wrong way. <laughs> What's an adventure like getting lost? <laughs>for about halfway in terms of distance, but I don't think we're anywhere close to halfway on time. This is the first bit of tarmac, albeit probably one of the smallest roads you'd find in the, in the UK. So far, we've been treated to gravel along the Catalonian Canal, some amazing single track, which was a bit of a surprise. So really needing bikes that can cover pretty much any terrain. Yeah, now the bikes we're using the Yolio G21s. We've also got their very own, own brand Yolio carbon rims as well. Mark's riding two by, I'm running one by. And then we've got some 45 mil gravel tires. But I'm gonna explain more of the detail of this very bike in a tech video, as well as the clothing we're wearing. We're not wearing our GCN kit. No, Gore have sent out some of theirs. And so we're pretty excited to get wearing it. And uh, also I'm gonna go into the technicalities of that very kit in that video. But. For now, I think we're going to enjoy some of the nice smooth asphalt. So we're, we're skying alongside, you can't quite see because of the trees here, Loch Askeg. And, you know, whilst as soon as we left Fort William, we were definitely leaving the last big town. The bit that we're heading into now really is one of the most remote parts of the British Isles. The road literally runs out in about 20 k's time and we'll be onto the, the off-road walking route, really. And uh, if you think out there, there's over 200 islands in the west coast, so we're still very much on the mainland, but you just forget, even without leaving the mainland, how utterly, utterly wild it can get. And, um, you know, I think that's why so few people ever, ever bring their bikes here. We're well into it now. And at some point up here, the car, the, the film crew are gonna have to leave us because there is no road. There is no way to get the car in. So the fact that we can film this, amazing. But from some point up the road here, we're gonna be on our own. And that's where it gets all exciting. Yeah, it's awesome. Look at this view, I mean, freaking paradise. So this, my friend, that's the end of the road, is where the road ends and the hike begins, or the track. Now it has to be said, we have taken proper precautions because we are going into the wilderness where it gets even more remote than where we've just been. So even pl planning a, a day ride like this, um, we've opted, as you should, to carry kit just in case the weather got gnarly and uh, we ended up a lot later than we planned. So. Out here in Scotland, we've got midi nets. The insects can be bad. Uh, don't think, I don't think they'll be too bad with the, with the wind today. Uh, we've brought a, a little sleeping bag, sleeping roll, and um, just a little tarp. Because, do you know what? If you injured yourself or you had a major mechanical and you were stuck out in the hills there, it's just good to know that you've got that backup plan. And there's no phone signal up here, so I'm even carrying a satellite phone. And the crew 
are going to be able to track us and see where we are. So, you know, it's a ton of fun until things go wrong and all that. So uh, it's good to it's good to think ahead. Yeah, and it's not just overnight kit we've got. We've also got plenty of clothing too, just in case we are, like Mark says, just stuck out longer than we would have liked. So this uh, this road from here is normally a. Uh, a hiker's trail and uh, yeah there's a couple of big passes before we get to the end of our day on the map it doesn't look very far let's find out let's get it oh this way it gets gnarly mark mark yeah let's get, let's get it gnarly First big climb, three, three and a half kilometers up. I mean, no complaints so far. We've got the world to ourselves, that's what it feels like. It's getting hard now. We've had to resort to walking. First big climb done. Ooh. And now I know why everyone said it's gonna take, it could take 10 hours to do 20K. Because that is slow going. But nevertheless, it's good. I love it. So boggy. Look at that. Right. Right, go on, get your foot out. <laughs> oh no! Still a long way to go, man. The route was incredible, taking our bikes over terrain that might be untouched by two wheels. Now, with all the epic scenery, it was really easy to forget that the riding needed our full concentration. No broken legs, we're good. We're good. It's getting late into the day now. The time is coming up to seven o'clock. As you can see, the sun's going down behind me. And that is our trail. So it's a proper kind of hiker bike, bike on the shoulder. Jobby, because there's no chance you can ride this. We are conscious that time is getting away from us. We've still got about 13K of this to go. I mean, I can see why we got warned that this was wasn't to be taken lightly because it's tough to bring bikes here. This is proper remote. This is a proper challenge, even though it's just a day. Look at that. Look forward to that beer. It now turned into a battle against the rapidly setting sun. Safely navigating in the dark just wasn't an option, so we had to keep moving. Second to last part. Down there, over that silhouetted mountain, and the pub awaits. It really doesn't look far. It doesn't look far on Wahoo, it doesn't look far in terms of that hill, but given what we've just been over the last two, three hours, 
I think we're gonna be dark or pretty close to dark before we get there. Right, it's, uh, it's nearly nine o'clock at night and um, it's gonna be a beautiful, beautiful sunset just, just over the back of the hill. We're not gonna see it from down here, but hopefully get a drone up and capture that. So it's taken us about four hours to do the last 11 kilometers. Often carrying the bike, pushing the bike, bog. I mean, just some of the hardest train I've ever taken a gravel bike over. And um, it's about 15K from here. And the prospect of doing that in the dark, even with lights, is uh, it's kind of next level. We knew it'd be gnarly, and we did plan for the worst, and it just shows you, it's, it's unbelievable when you're out here. What an amazing day, but I didn't actually think we'd get stuck out. What's going on, Hank? I mean, it's got pretty gnarly. We're in the bogs, but we're cracking on. What's the plan, mate? So the plan is to find some water, find a stream, and find somewhere to camp. What would your, on a serious note, what would your disclaimer be on this route for anyone watching this? I suggest you don't try this with a bike. That would be, that would be the disclaimer. Don't, and don't do this on your own, because it's proper in the middle of nowhere. It's gnarly. So, we have got to 10.30, and uh, we're calling it a night. We, to be honest, I've massively underestimated this journey. I, I was along the road, traveling at 35k an hour with Mark, going, how on earth can it take us nine hours? But let me tell you, the terrain that we've just tried to take our gravel, boat, uh, gravel bikes over has been one of the toughest terrains I think I've ever encountered. It's tough to walk across, let alone take a bike across. So we've, uh, we've kind of got to use our contingency. So we're going to camp here, we buy running water. Um, we're going to cook some food. And then at the crack of dawn, we're going to head up the mountain. But let me tell you, this is bite you off more than we can chew, I think. We're kicking. <laughs> we are kicking. And it's a, it's a nice mild night. We got food. We got a river. We got a breeze so we can keep the midges away. Life is good. I mean, we couldn't be more in the wild if we tried. Right, alarm for five o'clock. Oh, I love an early morning, Mark. <laughs> I think this one's going to be quite... We've just got a mountain to climb in the morning, that's all. <laughs> that's all we got to do. No, no. no, no. Good morning, good morning. It is five o'clock and uh, time to get up and out. First thing, pack away and walk across the river. So we've got about 6k more of hiking bike before we can get riding again. Luckily, we're all kitted up because it's pretty chilly this morning. So I've got my leg warmers, transition shorts, the long sleeve, my Gore-Tex jacket and my Gore-Tex trousers on just to keep nice and warm. Bike's packed up. The only job we've not done is put on these beauties. <laughs> the first thing that we're going to do is walk across the river, so we're just going to get wet again, but uh, grim, grim, grim. Big mountain climb has started. It's quite a treacherous route.
and we've made it to the top. Oh, that was tough. So keep in mind, we had an alarm call at five o'clock this morning. That's taken by the time we uh, packed up camp, two and a half hours to get to this point. And uh, you know, down, 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 that's good news. But, oh, I mean, I think it's gonna be another absolute epic. Whilst Mark took the sensible option of walking, I was dying to get back on my bike. I've had more crashes on this ride than any other ride I've ever been on. Made it down, onto track. Yes, we can now ride to the finish. Thank God. Pub for an early morning pint. How good does that feel? And there's the sea. Woo -hoo! Hard, hard, hard fought, hard won. Ah, oh, I genuinely thought it would be a really, really hard route. It was harder than that, and um, we took contingency to stay out because you always should but you know it didn't I just thought oh, we'll, we'll get over we'll get over that hill not a chance here we are 10 o'clock in the morning day two <laughs> rocking up Noidart Peninsula you have delivered it's been awesome and that's in Marie what a journey the Old Forge Lodge, or Old Forge Pub, I should say. We are very late for the planned pint. We're very early because it's not open yet. No. Nope. Uh, but well done, buddy. Survived another adventure. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I don't think I've ever worked quite so hard for such a short bike ride. If you look on a map, we've not gone very far. But from the canal riding up, following the, the loch, and then, of course, the epic double pass over the top. I mean. That is a walker's route. Let me remind you, yeah. a walker's route. We know that now. It's definitely not a cyclist route. <laughs> um, massive thank you to Yolio for supplying us with their gravel bikes. Make sure you go and check out the, the tech video and so you can see an in-depth look at the bikes. And also, a massive thank you to Gore as well for kicking us out in this epic gear. We needed it more than we thought we would because yes. we ended up sleeping out in the wild. Yeah, exactly that. Let us know in the comment section below if you enjoyed this video and if you want to see more of Mark and myself. And also, give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Right, we need to shoot because uh, we need to get a ferry. We do. <laughs> <laughs> see you later. While on a training camp in 2019, Team Ineos Grenadiers, including Geraint Thomas, Cameron Worth and Dylan Van Bala, decided to ride an entire lap of Mallorca, 312 kilometers, just for fun. And they did it in eight and a half hours, averaging 36 kilometers per hour. That distance and pace is mind blowing. Ollie and I want to see if with the help of modern kits and careful planning, how we would compare. How close could we get? Could we perhaps go even faster? Well, it's time to find out. This is going to be tough. I'm scared to do a fart just in case it's a poo. This route is tough. Starting and finishing in Alcudia, it's 312 kilometers long with nearly 4,000 meters of climbing. It's a beautiful route that takes in the UNESCO World Heritage Site of the Tramontana Mountains and many stunning coastal roads. Many of these roads are cycling bucket list material. Now we will be uploading our rides to Strava, so if you fancy riding the route, which is also the OG312 route, then you can actually download the GPX from our Strava activities, try it yourself, and see how you compare to both us and Ineos. 
This route is stunning any time of the year. And Ineos managed it in eight hours, 37 minutes. Moving time, their total time though, was nine hours, 18. So they averaged just under 36K an hour. And it appears they stopped for sandwiches just after Palmer. <laughs> it also appears they were just on a zone two endurance training ride. But the question is, if we ride absolutely full gas, can we beat the Ineos Grenadiers? Yeah, can us two chumps? going flat out, beat the world's best ride in zone two. It's kind of humbling, actually. Yeah, yeah. and we don't, if we don't stop for sandwiches as well, then we, I think we've got a chance. It felt like a good idea yesterday, and I'm incredibly apprehensive. Well, let's get cracking. Wish us luck. Energy, energy. You get, take some of my energy, energy. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> right, <laughs> we can do it, come on. Just coming past Fort Palenza now. Oh, it's so beautiful. It's going to be a tough day, and we're going to need every bit of help we can get if we're going to do it. Fortunately, we've got Abus on board, who've uh, kindly agreed to help make the video possible and sort us out with their Game Changer 2 helmets. You may recognise these as being worn by uh, the likes of Mobby Star, Alps de Kerning, and world champion Matthew van der Poel. And, uh, well, this is a, a size medium, it's 265 grams. But these aero helmets are gonna give us an advantage today. We've tested them in the wind tunnel. More on that later in the vid. Because now, well, we've got to crack on a bit. He's got a bloody puncture, isn't he? Well, good job we're prepared with spares. The best thing, thing is, I put my stuff in the van. The tube is in my uh, is in my rucksack. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't. In the us, probably had a team car with them with a spare wheel. Yeah. We're stuck here like a we pair need, of lemons. We, we desperately need oh, an inner tube. Yeah. Oh, that's that's, that's the ticket. Oh, good, quick picture, boys. We're all in. Have a good ride. Enjoy your ride. Yeah, good ride. Probably, we're probably faster than the Best thing about it is, Mallorca, hugely there popular with cyclists, like, actually saved our day. Saved our bacon, quite literally. So we're about a kilometer into our first climb of the day, the colder for Menya. It's about seven kilometers long with an average gradient of close to 5.4%. 5.7. 5.7, it's yeah. steeper than I said. Yeah, but it's still a fast climb. Now Ineos, according to Strava, averaged 18K an hour when they did this on their ride. We're currently doing about that, a bit less but it does speed up this climb towards the top. So we feel like we're on track. Just hitting the top of that first climb. We managed to go about the same speed as Ineos, but I think they were taking it a lot easier than us, mate. So nutrition is gonna be super important on this ride. Now, when Ineos did it, it looked like they mostly did it in zone two, but we're, we're definitely riding quite a bit above that. Yeah. So we're gonna to need to fuel We're gonna rip quite through a bit more. calories, aren't we? Yeah, so the basic strategy is for us to try and get in about 120 grams of beta fuel every hour. It's quite a lot. Yeah. For people that aren't used to consuming that amount of food and energy on the bike is something you need to build into your training. What also helps is the type of food that you're eating. Products like that are developed to try and be easy on your stomach and easily absorbed. Yeah. So hopefully it's another little trick of our sleeve that'll help us out. We need everything we can get. <laughs> So as you'd expect, 
we're using all the, the tech marginal gains we can. You know, wax chains all round. But in terms of the difference an aero helmet like the Game Changer 2 can make to you on a ride like this, well, when we've looked at aero helmets in the tunnel, it's going to vary depending on the helmet that you're switching to uh, and from, and also you as well, because aerodynamics is always system dependent. That being said, we feel confident in saying that you typically observe a sort of range in CDA reduction between 0.005 and 0.01 and, um, CDA. Well, I'll tell you what, for those of you that don't speak nerd, like Ollie, that equates to a difference of between around three to six minutes over the duration of the long ride that we're doing today. So if it comes down to the wire, it could be all that makes a difference. Yeah. Quick little up down progress now. So we have 234 kilometers to go. And we're actually on this beautiful coastal path on the north of the island, just past Dea where the roads are much quieter. We've got a six kilometer climb ahead of us. I think we're doing all right. Ollie, you good? Yep, yeah, Beautiful. all good. This is uh, one of the best roads in the world, I'd say. That is fantastic. So we're currently averaging 29.1 kilometers per hour, which is a lot slower than the total average time we're aiming for, but this route is front loaded with lots of mountains. And so, Ineos, in the first 140k, averaged 29.4. So that's kind of the ballpark we're aiming at. I'm just wondering why you seem to be on a different bike. Marginal gains to the max, mate. It's what the pros would do. We've done most of the climbing now, so I've gone for a, a, a bike change, like what the pros do. Work for Primoz. Where's what my other bike? Cy lent me his aero bike and some uh, 858s. <laughs> of course For the did. flat section. Whatever. Yeah, it's going to be good, isn't it? Right on. still to go, 162k. <laughs> 175k in, we're really struggling now. It was really slow going past Palmer, quite a bit of traffic. And now we just got savage headwind. It's really like killing our average speed. It's hampering progress. Yeah. I'm going for a bit of a and bad patch. It's over 30 degrees. It's hard. This section of the ride it's getting faster now. Really flat, nice roads. And the choice to go to the aero bike is uh, what I'm glad I've done. We're 100k to go, mate. Oh. Average speed is creeping up. But yeah, but my ability and energy is falling rapidly. Is it? I mean, uh, oh, mate, I'm struggling, but I'm hanging in there. Hang in, buddy. Not long. Oh, man, you're motoring along. Look, I love it. Just think of, the, of that pudding trolley at the, at the Zafiro Palace Hotel. 
that endless oh. pudding trolley. The, the more you eat, the more they just replace and bring back out onto the buffet pudding oh. trolley. It feels like bottomless safe. pudding trolley. It just feels, think of that. Your favourite thing. It feels so far away. It's some random villagey town. I've been suffering for the last hour and a half now. I don't want to put a downer on it. It feels like the wheels are coming off of our bus. I can't pretend, I am bloody struggling. We've got 80k to go. Right now, the thing that I'm finding the hardest is the heat. It's like 30 degrees today, and uh, it, we're just drinking water constantly, but... Oh, man, it's... Have you seen the state of my shorts? They're actually salt. Yeah, <laughs> very salty. And your top. Do you know what? I uh, am somewhat regretting our decision to do this now. Yeah, I am, yeah. yeah. To be fair, yeah. Honestly, Ollie, yeah, yeah. Go without me. It's fine. I just can't be doing with like fast time now. I just, we just need to get it done and like, I just, even if I, I just set off slow, I just need to keep moving. Let alone the sort of people I want to be riding with right now. Baskets. They're doing yeah. it right, aren't they? We're idiots. I mean, if we stand any hope of beating any of us, we've got 40 minutes left. I don't think I've got it in me. We have... Oh, it breaks my heart saying it. 58k. Come on! Ah, oh, Alex, you f It's one of those things, like, when you do something this long, you don't know what's going to happen. You, you, you're going into the unknown. Yeah, mate, I'm there. Ah, oh, I think I'm just dead. Eight hours 40. That was our time goal. That's an anti-climax, isn't it? Oh, I've got nothing left, mate. I know, but I'll help. Gonna stop for a minute. Yeah, that would be best, Alex. What do you need? So bad. Oh, I'm really pissed off. Dude, look at that state of me. God, just get moving again. What's so funny is I. <clears throat> I'm the exact person that would be like, oh, come on, crack on. Yeah, so have to work with yourself, right? Yeah, right, I'm gonna move. We're on the home stretch, about 16 kilometres left. And I think it's fair to say that Alex is currently experiencing the biggest bonk of his life. I started out with the best of them. You've, mate, you've, you've got this. That is a truly impressive amount of salt that's all over your... Uh, just all over you, basically. But yeah, we got it, man. This is home straight. It's gonna, we've, we've got it. I feel like I've needed a poo for the last five hours. Uh. It's got to the point where I'm scared to actually have a fart in case it's a poo. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I'm scared. It's getting cooler. 
temperature's more comfortable yeah. now. The crowns of mine. My ears are like echoing. Ah. So I'd uh, sit down and wait in the shade. Finish is just down there. Do you want to just roll down a bit and then we'll come to a stop? Yeah? Get it done? It's like literally in sight. Come on, thank you. I feel so bad he's in such a bad way. Thanks, mate. You all right? Good riding. Where? Just here by Burger King. Did it. Well done, mate. Give me a high five. Crossing our imaginary finish line, we managed to complete the ride in 10 hours, 1 minute and 24 seconds, with an average speed of 31.1 kilometres per hour. Although slower than Ineos overall, we did go slightly faster than them over the first 140k in the mountains. Oh, and uh, Alex, well, he was six kilograms lighter. Well done. I mean, mate, you, you've absolutely smashed it. It's all right. I am a... Uh... I mean, that's a rival for, like, one of Connor's bonks, that is. Yeah, I'm so bad. My ears have gone funny and they're echoing. We'll get back to the hotel. The pudding trolley awaits. We didn't beat the time. No, we didn't, but I'm, uh, I think this is a perfect opportunity to pull out my big book of cycling excuses. So one, we got a puncture. Two, we had a, we had a headwind. It was warmer when they did it. Yeah. It was in like a colder time of the year, so it wasn't 30 degrees. So we had that. You also had to wait for me. They, a had, a, they had a full team. It was mm. just me and you and um, they're quite a bit better than us. I think we can be proud, but um, well, if, if you like, well, if you think we've done a, a good job today, then um, and you're impressed with Alex's bonk. I mean, just for your salt stains, they should give the video a thumbs up. I think I'm just hugely dehydrated from this salt. Yeah. And, um, yeah, let me know, show your respect for, for uh, my efforts. And I think we, I think it's fair to say, helmets, Travel the lap of the island now. Yeah. <laughs> Big thanks to Abus for making this video happen. And yeah. um, we'll see you in the next one. Share it with your friends if you've got any. I don't think I've got any left now. Right. Come on, Alex. Let's go. I don't want to cycle back. Come on, you've got it. Just round the corner. Am I going to win Big Sugar? Let's face it, probably not. Am I even going to finish? Well, I guess we're going to find out. This is my wife Chloe, and for the last six months she has been riding and training with the help of Humango, an artificial intelligence training platform, to take on the toughest event of her life, Big Sugar. We have flown over the big pond to the birthplace of gravel riding, the USA. More specifically, Bentonville in the state of Arkansas, right in the middle of the Ozark Mountains. The course Chloe and myself are taking on is the 104 mile version with an elevation gain of almost 2,000 meters. We have two checkpoints along the route where we can stock up on food and drink, but other than that, we are heading into the unknown to see if beginner gravel rider Chloe can complete this race, and if so, where on earth will she finish? Hey. 
The Peak Sugar is the last event within the Lifetime Grand Prix series and pretty much wraps up the 2023 gravel race season. But with the likes of newly crowned gravel world champion Cassia Numadoma racing, it's still very much an all guns blazing race. But this video isn't really about me. Head of my first ever gravel race, I do feel nervous. Just the anticipation of what's to come ahead of us. But yeah, mostly excited. I can't wait to get stuck in. Chloe and I have got two absolutely mega bike setups to use, thanks to the support of the kind people at Lauf and Forge and Bond Wheels. And I'll tell you more about our bikes later on, because seeing as this is an actual race, we're to go and get signed on. Oh, wow. <laughs> Rider not fail. <laughs> After signing on, it was time to get our feet up, fuel up our bodies, and get an early night, as the alarms were set for 4.30 a.m. Feeling good? <laughs> I don't know. We're probably like an hour and a half out. Yeah. All we need to do is go get changed, get sorted, last minute toilet stop. Yeah. If I'm gonna need like 10 wee stops. <laughs> Stash our pockets <laughs> full of bars and shells. Yeah. We haven't got anything else to do. No. Smile, be happy, enjoy it. Yeah. Make sure we eat and drink. Yeah. Easy. Sounds easy when we do it like that. Yeah. Just ride. Yeah. What are you feeling? I feel a bit calm. I feel calm now. I felt a bit sick when I first woke up. <laughs> <laughs> Rolling up to the start line, you could really feel the atmosphere starting to build. Everyone was getting ready in their pen, trying to find their space. Chloe's rolling the route up. Final prep in terms of who's going where, what's happening. Um, it's getting real. I was actually just really looking forward to like starting and just getting on the bike and going. Chloe, we're a few minutes out. We better, we better get on our bikes, get dialed in. We better put our game faces on. Yeah. It's business time. Let's do it. Let's do it. The start of the race was mad. We had a police rollout, which was so exciting. My adrenaline was going, my heart was pumping so fast. All these people around us trying to get in, in position. Alex even made us like ride right up to the front. So we saw the front of the race for a short while. But I was just really excited to get on the gravel and get going. When we first hit the gravel, it was chaos. There was people everywhere. It was so dusty, you could barely see in front of you. Everyone was trying to find their spot in the race. Rocks flying everywhere. I just tried to stay calm, but we were going, we were going pretty fast. We were trying to stay with the front group for as long as we could. Settled in now, close tucked in behind me. The hustle and bustle of the race star is just starting to fade out. We're lying out into little groups. Sun's coming up. We're here for one hell of a day. So, Chloe's struggling to eat on the bike. It's pretty tough with all the bits of gravel, change of terrain, the pace. Eating now is what's gonna fuel her to the end. I just find it really hard to eat. Yeah? I just, yeah. I've gotta be, but I'm not remotely hungry. Of course, 
force feeding food down you is not fun on gravel, but it's good in terms of the actual riding. What's the atmosphere? What's the vibe? Feelings? Yeah. Amazing, everyone's really happy and supportive. Yeah. And uh, yeah, gravel's really good. Times like this, a bit gradual, yeah, not too gravelly. So, those ones back there that were like steep, but like really like thick gravel that you can't really get a proper line in. Yeah, I struggle with. Well, this one's pretty much over now. Nice little downhill. One of our major climbs of the day, I think that was. At least it looks it on the profile. One hour 45 minutes down or in, you know what I mean. Hi, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rack bikes up. Yeah, that actually went way quicker than I thought. <laughs> You've got so much dust on your nose. <laughs> it's gravel. Having reached the first checkpoint, we headed off to restock our supplies for the miles ahead. And while I do that, let me tell you a little bit more about our bikes. So we're using the Seaglut from Lauf, which is an Icelandic brand, and they've been in the game of making gravel bikes pretty much ever since gravel has been a thing. And what kicked that all off was this absolutely nuts looking fork. It's called the Grit. This is actually the third generation of the fork, and it provides around 30 millimeters of vibration absorbing travel and suspension at the front of your bike. Lauf say this design is ideal for the high frequency vibrations that you get when you're riding over gravel. Not only is it helping improve the comfort that you get, they also say it's gonna speed you up and increase the traction too. Comfort and compliance is a theme which Lauf continue through the frame and up at the handlebars with something called ICE. This stands for Integrated Compliance Engineering, in case you didn't speak Lauf. Um, they say their smoothie handlebar offers twice the compliance as what other carbon handlebars do. And then at the seat tube area at the back, the ICE that's implemented there is allowing for up to 15 millimeters of flex and compliance under full load when you're going over the rough stuff. Now, following on with that idea that making your bike comfortable and compliant helps make it faster, the guys at Forge and Bond have hooked us up with their 25 GR wheels. Now, the way that they're going around approaching the idea of comfort and compliance for speed is through their fusion fiber technology in the carbon fiber wheels. Not only is it gonna help speed us up, but it also has an environmental impact too, because it uses long chain nylon polymers instead of the traditional epoxies and resins which are used in your traditional carbon fiber manufacturing. Forge and Bond say this allows the wheels to absorb impacts through microscopic flexing in those carbon fibers. It also means that when these wheels come to the end of their usable life, they can then be recycled into new forged carbon fiber parts, not just once, but multiple times over. Unfortunately, they can't be recycled into a brand new set of wheel rims though. Now, I know I've only briefly spoken about some of the setup of our bikes. We've also got some bags holding all our snacks and spares, big water bottles so that we don't get dehydrated and thirsty. But there are far more exciting details and bits of information and tech to go through. So much so that over on the GCN Tech channel, I'm gonna have a video where I go into a full deep dive on the whole kit and the setup that is hopefully gonna allow us to get to the finish line. Um, so go and check that out. Coming up to the first feed zone at mile 38, I was actually feeling really good. The time had gone really quick, quicker than I was expecting, which gave me a bit of a morale boost. We were riding pretty like hard on some bits and I was like, I need to just chill this out. Alex had been telling me and reminding me to keep eating. I was kind of struggling already at that point to get enough food down. I'm really trying to eat. Bring it back to me, it's my own I just, done. I Thank feel you. good. I just, um, <laughs> the eating is making me feel sick. Well, I don't do know if that makes any shuttle. sense, shuttle. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not hungry, which I guess is so a good thing. And I'm having to eat every half hour, hour but try to see if I can access I'm just really, here. trying to force food, um, food down you is not well, very thing, nice. It's the same thing. And I'm I trying to have something savory. Well, banana and I've got some Doritos. I'm trying to drink some water. Let me just see. Because when we get back on the bike, it'll be bars, chews, gels, so. All quite sweet. It all jumbles but... together in my brain. 
I'm just trying right, to take so my time and not rush. I think if I rush, it's going to make it worse. Just, I, I just wasn't feeling hungry, but I knew how important it was. So I was looking forward to having a bit of a break from the bike, having something savoury, just taking a minute to reset. Feed zone one completed, on to the next. the prize for best jersey of the race. Thanks. <laughs> That's a big one. Good job. The first few miles after the feed zone, we were on a real high and feeling really good. But that feeling was short-lived. Hello? I just, I just, I literally just feel sick. What's wrong with me? I'm making a drama over nothing here. Just struggling to eat. That's okay. It's just one of these things to overcome. Mm. Right, we can just keep chipping away. Eating, I can't. Yeah, it's hot. But I'm trying to be positive. Halfway. But yeah, I can't lie. I'm finding it a little bit difficult. What I've learned from this race is that there's going to be lots of highs and lots of lows, and that's the same for everyone. I think having the support of Alex really helped me to bounce back from my lows. We're smashing it so far, Chloe. We're at the stage where like everyone's gonna find it tough. Yeah. Don't don't think that it's just you find it tough, everyone is. That's true. Everyone's so nice, aren't they? Friendly and everyone's like, put a brave face on it. We stopped just back there to have something to be in. Everyone's like, you're right, do you need anything? So Yeah. That's good. So as we as I started to bounce back, we actually made up loads of good time on a load of the sections. And we actually we took loads of people. We were on a roll. Don't tell me we've got right back up there. Until progress was halted. I did curse it. I've got a puncture. Well, I guess that's where it is. Yeah. He's got to find it. There it is. Yeah. Back in the game. With over five months worth of training complete, the hard work was done, but there's still time for some last minute tips and advice for Chloe from none other than current gravel world champion, Cassia Nefia Doma. I think that, um, yeah, there's no point of stressing because okay. I feel like everyone comes here just like wanting to experience yeah. the gravel scene. Uh, me included, I just want to soak it up and I feel like definitely you want to make sure that after the finish line you feel like oh I gave my best, yeah. whether it's like for 10th or 50th or 150th yeah. position, whatever, but as long as you know that you had fun and you gave your best, I feel like it's the biggest achievement. Yeah. And also I would say that, you know, crashing or puncturing is a part of the game and that does worry me a bit but <laughs> we're crashing know, yeah <clears throat> but you know like we all crash so many yeah. times and at the end of the day you have a cool story to tell yeah. you know <laughs> yeah, <it's true. laughs> it might hurt but then it's it's not a big de yeah. deal you know
So have you felt better than since the last stop? Mm. I did struggle for a bit after that. Um, but then, yeah, then like got through it and came round. And I've been feeling really good the last, last like hour and a half. Right, we got this, come on. These are some incredible views. Look at that. Open stuff. So open. Absolutely beautiful. We are genuinely flying. We've come out of the second feed zone in good shape. Chloe's gone through a bad patch. We're on a good run again now. So make hay while the sun shines, as they say. Rolling out of the second feed with 30 miles to go, and it was at this point that I think it both clicked and we were like, we're, we're gonna do this and we're gonna finish strong. We'd actually ridden really smart the whole race. We hadn't started off too fast or too hard. We'd preserved enough energy to make sure that we were gonna enjoy the last bit of the race. Maybe for the last time. She won't know I'm saying this, but she's so much better than she ever will realize. How do you get someone to realise they're quite good at cycling? I don't know. To be dancing up in the air Will you hold my hand when we fall? I don't think I dare The secret racer in built in Chloe is starting to come out now. 15 miles. No, 12 miles to go. And Chloe's going, come on, more. Let's go faster. Push on. I think we're gonna get this thing done in under seven hours. Come on, let's do this. Coming into the finish straight, it just suddenly hit me that like we'd done it together. I was just really proud of myself. And I was just feeling really grateful to have this opportunity to, to do this. It was incredible. And having Alex by my side was like an amazing feeling. There's not many people that could say they could do that with their other half. And, and it was, you know, really also down to Alex that got me to the finish. I couldn't have done it without him. I was feeling really emotional. I feel like we've truly captured the spirit of Gravel. Yeah, the spirit of Gravel is like, well, like literally it's for anyone. Anyone can do it. You can ride anything, like any age. There was people on tandems, people on single speeds. Yeah, so all in all, 104 miles, seven hours, one puncture, a few shed tears, but we've had a smile on our face the whole we way around. We enjoyed it, like, I, we took it in. Right, and on that note, huge thanks to everyone that we saw out on the course, that shouted, cheered. I hope everyone's had a brilliant day. 
And big shout out to the support we've had from Lau, Forge and Bond and Humango for keeping us fit, strong and healthy and getting us under that sub seven hour mark. Got us to, got us to this point. If you want to see uh, more details about our bikes, kit and all the setup, head over to GCN Tech. But otherwise, please let us know in the comments section down below. And please, like, if you're thinking about doing the challenge, if you're thinking of pushing yourself out of your comfort zone, like, do it, please. And let me know. Yeah, let him share it in the comments how proud everyone is in public. Right, we're going to go get a beer. <laughs> I love you. All right, well, you get all the attention. One more round of applause, Chloe Pack. Been people going down left, right, and centre. Still going, guys. <laughs> going through a real bad patch. If I'm totally honest. Oh, Cracks. Earlier this year, I accidentally entered an ultra endurance race. I mean, it was done so casually. A quick message on Instagram, and boom, there it was, my name added to the start list. Now, as time went on, my entry seemed to be an increasingly bad idea. However, by that point, I'd mentioned it to Shimano, who thought it sounded great and wanted to make it happen, because with their GRX group set, this kind of thing is right up their street. So, I couldn't really back out anymore. And so it is that I'm less than 24 hours away from what is almost undoubtedly gonna be the hardest thing I've ever attempted on a bike. 400 miles, 640 kilometers, self-supported on a mix of road and gravel. The clock will not stop until I reach the finish line, if I can reach the finish line. And if I'm completely honest, no matter which way I look at this, I cannot quite work out how I'm gonna be able to finish. Any time I got to the end of a 200 mile ride before this, I've been completely and utterly ruined, and it's not escaped my notice that that is only half of the distance here. Now, I am mildly terrified, but also incredibly excited about this. I've not been able to think of anything else for the last couple of weeks, almost literally. As you can see, I've got all the equipment I could possibly wish for. I could just probably do with a few last words of wisdom. Hey, Ty. Hey, Mark. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. What are you up to? Well, I've done something a bit stupid, if I'm honest, mate. I've entered a 400-mile unsupported bike race, and I honestly haven't got a clue what I'm going to do or how I'm going to finish it. So I thought maybe you could give me some tips. <laughs> I can confirm your concerns. It is a lot, lot harder. It is, it is next level hard. I would, my, my top recommendation is to ride on map, not on data, because otherwise you're just going to stare at those numbers and you're going to be going, why can't I ride faster? I was recently told a, a brilliant line, which I tried to remember throughout GB Duro, which was ultra endurance gravel races are never won at lunchtime. So when the sun is shining, you feel good. That's not the time that you win or lose. It's in the graveyard shift. It's when everyone's tired. So those first miles in the middle of the day, that's kind of the bit that will take care of itself. It's uh, it's the grittier end when you're you know sleep deprived and you're trying to push on through. That's that's what really sort of splits the field. The top of your decision making matrix is I'm going to do this safely. I'm going to get through without having a crash or an injury. And then below that, I am going to finish. And then realize that there's points in a 400 miler you're just not going to be in a happy place but that's not a reason not to finish what i'm most nervous about is i'll actually see what i'm made of in this all those times when i've watched you doing stuff and hank recently and jenny of course and then now i'm actually going to see whether i can do it <laughs> you've got this buddy you've got it remember top top of the list stay safe middle you will finish right at the bottom is try and have some fun along the way but first and foremost stay safe and uh, get to the end great stuff thanks mark as always mate 
The race, further east, is the brainchild of Camille McMillan, a photographer, a cyclist, and a part-time sadist. The route comes from former transcontinental winner Josh Ibert, himself also a sadist and a masochist too, because he's racing this event as well. Now, it starts near Cambridge, a few miles north of London, here in the UK, and then carves its tortuous 400-mile line around much of East Anglia, touching the North Norfolk coast, and then back to the starting point. Camille was keen to stress that this is a relaxed, grassroots event. The race start is in a wood, and you're not allowed to drive there. There we go, pre-race accommodation sorted. I'm not gonna take this tent with me. Uh, I just didn't fancy bivvying out the night before a 400 mile bike ride. But sleep is a really good point actually. Tomorrow, the fast riders won't, basically. It will just be a 30 hour bike ride, just. The question is, do I feel confident enough putting myself in that bracket? Because if I don't, that's gonna have implications about what I have to take, a sleeping bag, a bivy bag, and so forth. The answer is actually that I just don't know. I do not know whether I'm capable of going through the night. I have no way of knowing because I've never done it before. So this is the proper adventure. Might take my aero bars off and fashion another tent pole just to make it slightly bigger. Well, that's actually not bad when you're in here. Don't know which GCM presenter to use this last, but it's got a certain um, hum to it. And I'd probably advise stopping and topping up with enough food if you plan to ride through the night by about seven o'clock. Because there's lots of shops, there's loads of supply, but quite a few of them are small village, village shops and they kind of shut early, so don't get You have stamped. arrived. <laughs> <laughs> right, it's nearly oh, game time. I think it was about 30-ish people have signed on. They all look remarkably normal, so uh, I don't quite know how this has become superhuman and ride through the night, but we'll see. We're gonna go turn in for the night, get an early one. Leave the campfire, It'll be very boring. Right then, here we go. Ready to rock and roll, it's 4.54. This is the remains of Camp Richardson. And, uh, yeah, there's no hiding it. Just tried to have some breakfast. I feel really a bit nauseous. I think that's nerves, or it could be the fact that it's five to five and I don't really want to be up and awake, but it's a beautiful day. It's mild and I'm about to ride 400 miles of brilliant terrain. So I've got to be excited at that. Okay, let's get going. first section in the dark down that bit of greasy single track down the Roman road and there was just noises everywhere I did, it was just I was just completely disoriented and people sort of like slipping off because it was greasy and whatever else anyway once we got out of that and the, the sun came up then it was it was great Cambridge here we go. It just feels like, feels like I've gone abroad. This isn't the UK. This is like, my world shrunk so much that this now feels like the most exotic place I've been to in 18 months. Right, first stopping off point. No idea where I am, but this village shop has just sorted me out with some more water. 
which is cool. Um, felt a bit weird stopping and saying goodbye to, uh, to my group. Um, well, which was actually just me and uh, a very nice chap who, uh, I don't think I ever got his name actually. Um, anyway, oh, enough jibber jabber. I need to crack on again. Incredibly beautiful around here. I feel very lonely all of a sudden and a bit daunted again. It was so nice cruising along, meeting and chatting to a, a new group of people. And then here I am now on my Todd, having stopped early for some water. And uh, I don't know, it's exciting. I might, I might be a little bit lonely, but I'm, I feel so incredibly fortunate to be here. I know that sounds a bit knobby, but I do. And uh, I'm gonna try and hold on to this moment for as long as possible and remember it at four in the morning. This is me conquering my fears, ladies and gentlemen. These are Britain's most dangerous animal. Rich is dancing on the pedals and I am, well, I'm bricking it quite frankly. One of them actually mooed at me in a very aggressive manner. And, uh, well, I don't take kindly to being mooed at. Particularly when I can't do any full gas effort and escape. But I think I might have got away with it this time. Freaking cows. Tempted to stop being a vegetarian. Smash and grab number two, elevens is. Uh, it's, uh, I didn't mean to get that. Plus, that dodgy white powder, remember, is the end of it. That was a stupid bag to put in, wasn't it? for a little while, been ticking the kilometers down. I haven't been looking at uh, how far I've done or how far to go as per recommended. But um, fatigue's creeping in, if I'm totally honest. Um, I'm really hungry. I've been eating and drinking, but uh, definitely getting ready for some kind of lunch. Um, in terms of an update on dare I say it, the competitive aspect. Turns out we got a slightly bit of misleading info. There is one rider ahead of us. When I say us, that there is my main man, Rich, who uh, we've just been chatting away happily for the last goodness knows how many kilometers. And uh, we're making an effective team right now. So uh, struck up an alliance. And uh, there's a definitely a sense of security uh, after I stopped earlier and uh, Fortunately, I managed to catch back up on a flat bit of road using my aero bars. Right then, I uh, just smashed and grabbed found some more gluten-free pita breads, which is fantastic, because uh, I lost my second pack uh, somewhere, uh, well, somewhere before Cambridge at half past five. But uh, anyway, it's all good. Um, I'd actually earmarked this spot. It's from a place called Harold's, 190k in. I'd earmarked it, because there's a fish and chip shop over there, for, uh, for dinner, basically. Um, and we got here at second lunchtime, which is <laughs> flipping amazing. I'm absolutely delighted. Um, and as you can tell by my hurrying, <laughs> I've, I've got into the competitive spirit. <laughs> so I'm now... <laughs> oh God, it's awful. Um, we just had a really slow 20K, like in some kind of like maze of fields with like, oh God, we went, took a wrong turn, ended up in a ploughed field. It was bloody annoying. But um, anyway, game on. We're here now. Uh, and yeah. This is cool. Right. This is bloody great, this is. Oh, 
our rapid average speed has plummeted as we're inching our way around a field. You know, I stepped off today and I was like, ah, I'm gonna leave it in the big ring all day because it's flat. And I have been in my 31 little ring more often than I care to remember. But that said, there's a lot of fast stuff and it's been nice sticking it in the 48 and just rolling along. But yeah, right now, just trying to make progress. I'm gonna put a camera away now. through a real bad patch if I'm totally honest. This is uh, this is really tough. Um, I think Rich is in the same kind of place. Still putting the same effort in, but just not going anywhere near as fast. The trails have been slow, the road slow, just it's a big old headwind. I just had some salt and vinegar crisps to try and reset my stomach a little bit because I, uh, I just didn't fancy eating anything else. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm pushing my bike up a hill. Oh, it's a very steep hill. Still, didn't expect that today. It's kind of like, um, like I think of it like time trials in the old days, like hundreds of years ago when they all used to wear alpaca, and, uh, and it's all a bit. Uh, uh. So it, it's a it's a spirited group ride that's tracked with spot dot spot trackers, bringing in a looser idea of what bike riding can be. I want to sort of like break away from categories like this is mountain biking, this is gravel riding, this is road racing. Actually, they're all bikes. Let's just ride bikes and enjoy riding bikes. Four kilos of chips, the large mushy peas. I'm so glad that last bit was fast, but I am kicking myself that I didn't get any liquid beforehand. What? What a noob, basically. What a noob. So, um, do you want if I eat my chips? Kind of dusky now, so my thoughts are very much dominated by what's about to come night time. So, I packed a lot more than everyone else. I packed a sleeping bag and a baby bag and a warm jacket, and so that was my saddle bag basically. Um, and not that many people, other people had it. I didn't want to be that guy that was overconfident in my abilities and then came unstuck and didn't finish. I had to scratch at 4 a.m. with hypothermia and stuff. So that was why I thought it was a good idea to just give me the best possible chance of finishing. 
but I hadn't made up my mind about whether or not I was going to bivy it out. Um, I was quite interested to, to try and go for 24 hours. I just want to see what happens as much as anything. I don't want to tell myself I'm going to stop. I want to see if I can do it. And then if I can't, I have a lovely sleeping bag to curl up in. And I tell you what, unless the scenery changes dramatically, this is uh, it's campsite heaven around here. There's hedges, there's soft grass, be amazing. You'll wake up to a breakfast of blackberries. Ah, oh, not to mention cheese pitters. Oh yeah. Hey. And to begin with, it was great. It was a really warm evening. We were riding around Rutland, which is this kind of very gentle English county. It was all very safe. There's these like savage sections up on the dikes where it's really slow, bumpy grass. And that was the point at which, after the first one of those, I really felt like it had taken it out of me. And then I got tired, I started yawning and things. Uh, we caught Josh at that point, that perked me up a bit, gave me something to kind of, I don't know. It wasn't like I was actively chasing him, I just felt better when we caught him. And then we went through Kings Lynn where there were loads of street lights and that made me feel better. Um, and then I think at that point though, I'd sort of made the decision in my head that I was going to sleep. Right, I don't suppose you can see anything, but hopefully you can hear me. It's currently 3 a.m. Got 460 kilometers on the clock. That's the sea. This is Hunstanton. Uh, and uh, yes, we're riding through it at four in the morning. I'm out of my tree right now. I have covered 300 miles, which is ridiculous. Not ridiculous, good, ridiculous, just ridiculous. I mean, why would you do that? Um, anyway, Josh is carrying on because uh, he's going to do 400 miles. Um, but I need to stop. I'm going to curl up in a sleeping bag for a little bit. Uh, basically, I've let myself get cold. I haven't drunk enough. I haven't eaten enough. I just. I just completely shut down and um, I'm really sore. I'm cozy. My legs are literally like shaking, which uh, I don't think is a good sign. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna have something to drink and then get my head down. Night night. It's six o'clock. Then I really, really should get up. Uh, and I will. It's freaking cold.
yet. I cannot tell you how much better I feel than just two and a half hours ago. The sun's up. I've got some power back in my legs, not much, but more. And this is just absolutely magical. Very interestingly about maths, I reckon if I'm going 5k an hour faster, then actually I can make that time back between now and the finish. The question is how much of a lift everyone else has got from the fact that the sun has come up. And in fact, can I sustain this pace? But it's weird, it's so weird. I might be feeling better, but I'm obviously completely ruined. There was a couple out, dot watchers, and I've right, got to go again. I was like, oh, hello. And I turned away and just start, started welling up. I don't know why. I think it's just a sign of being on the edge. But yeah, what a roller coaster. What a roller coaster. Cracked. I'm gonna have a cheese sandwich. I've just been riding down this. I've got that to go. And uh, yeah, I just need to have a sit down. So I thought I'd be uh, make myself useful, make a cheese sandwich, take my uh, hat off, that kind of jazz. So there we go. YouTube gold there. So one of the lessons that I'd learnt from the previous day was if you think you need to stop and you see somewhere a bit go, ah, to f stop, and stop, because you never know when the next one's coming. So I saw somewhere, I went, ah, and then he'd stop. And I was like, no, no. So I stopped and it was this little cafe and so I'd, I had to fill up both my bottles and then I thought, well, you know, I'll buy a coffee, I'll treat myself to a coffee. I needed a treat. I, uh, well, no, to start with, actually, I just needed some water. And then when I went into the cafe, uh, emotions is clearly still running high. Nearly, nearly had a little cry when ordering my special treat, which is a coffee, um, and an enormous bag of pick me ups. It's not many of crisps. Right, nearly done. Final thing is I remembered that I had packed headphones, so I never ever ride with music. Never, I've never done it. And um, but I was like, I think it could be good. Um, so, I, so I packed headphones and made up a really rubbish playlist of um, songs that I would never normally listen to, but I figured I might hit the spot. You've got to fly like an eagle. Oh yeah, Mama. I see a little silhouette of a scaramouche, scaramouche, will you do the fandango? Love is brilliant. Love is pure. This is how ruined I am. I got tears streaming down my face. Listen, James Blunt. Crikey. I don't think I'll ever better do this again. And I don't just mean listening to James Blunt.
Hey, check this out. This is uh, my crisp dispenser. I got a giant bag of salt vinegar crisps down there. And so it was that I did indeed manage to finish further east, all 398 miles of it, in a time of 33 hours, 13 minutes and 6 seconds, of which 27 hours, 52 minutes were spent moving. The rest was faffing, getting water, eating, and an hour and 45 minutes of it were spent sleeping under a hedge. Now, incredibly though, I didn't just actually managed to finish further east. They also finished third. The winner, Neil Phillips, tore around the course and won with a comfortable margin and indeed finished in time for breakfast on Saturday morning. Josh Ibert stayed well clear and took second place. And Rich Rothwell, the man that I had spent much of day one riding with, had a GPS malfunction almost literally within sight of the finish line and ended up doing a second lap. And so I snuck through for third place. But I am as surprised as you are. If either of us feel, we all feel. Everything I feel right now is pain and wanting to go to bed. I was just in such a dark place when I got off the bike and I'm sure I'll be in the dark place again in a few hours. When you've got no idea what's going on, carry on. You can feel it in the legs now, and I've got 20 hours to go. Land's End and John Oak Roads are Great Britain's geographical extremes, southwest and northeast. To travel between them from end to end is 1,348 kilometers. It's a classic long distance cycling route and a rite of passage for many. A good rider could take eight to 10 days to cover the distance, but we're gonna try and do it in just two. Or well, that's the aim anyway. Mark Beaumont and I have set ourselves the challenge of being the fastest ever two person relay. Is 1,400 kilometers in less than 40 hours within reach? With Mark's history of ultra endurance and my background as a pro cyclist, we're hoping we stand a fair chance, but it's gonna to prove to be one of our toughest challenges yet. The plan we have is a simple one, riding one hour on and one hour off from start to finish. It's tried and tested tactic, but one that will push our minds and bodies to breaking point. Fatigue, sleep deprivation, and a relentless schedule that offers little room for mistakes or moments of weakness. We have help though. Argon 18 have supplied us with two bikes each. An E118 time trial bike for the pure speed and a Krypton Supply Endurance road bike for the hills. And we also have quite the team behind us. So we've driven to the edge of the world. Well, it definitely feels like the edge of the world. We're at the most southern end of the United Kingdom at Land's End. First time I've ever been here before and it's the start line to our epic challenge and one I'm actually pretty nervous for. The good thing is though is that I'm not starting first so um, I've got an hour just to see how Mark's self is in, see what the pace is like and uh, before I get my skin suit on and uh, do my first my first section. The good thing is though is that the sun is shining, there's blue sky out, 
but even better than that is that the wind is coming from a southerly point. So that basically means that we've got a, uh, a tailwind uh, for the first section or it'll be on our right hand shoulder. I'm jumping into the unknown here. I kind of don't know what's gonna happen. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty nervous, but it's only, it's gonna be expected, isn't it? I'm pretty nervous. Because of the last year's mayhem and lockdown and travel, it's a while since I've been on the star line of anything this major. You know, throughout my career, I'm used to doing something, you know, at least every year, every six months, which scares me. And uh, I've not had that fix for the last year. So it's strange to be back in a position where I'm, I'm excited, but I'm nervous about what lies ahead. And it's, um, it reminds me that I've missed this. I've missed this. I mean, this, this nervousness, the butterflies, uh, is a perfectly normal thing to feel at the start, the start of something so massive. Um, it means I'm ready and uh, you know, definitely in the right headspace for it. I'm kicking off, I'm starting, and uh, we've got an hour to go. Mike has recruited some of his own performance team from his 80 day round the world record to give us every chance of completing this epic challenge. First off, we have Mike Griffiths, a man with a military background and a stickler for details. Mike is the team leader and will be in the follow vehicle, keeping us up to date with the route, timings and supporting us on our hour long stints. We then have Laura Penhall, our performance manager, a vital member of the team. She'll be looking after our nutrition, our bodies and helping us mentally to push past our limits. She'll be in the second support vehicle that will travel in the hours we are off the bike and jump ahead ready for our next stint. Now every challenge that I take on needs a mechanic and Alex Glasgow is the perfect man for that job. He will be sorting out any issues we have on the road. We then have Ian, our second support team driver, Bridgie the chef and Dave, our paramedic that hopefully we won't need. Mm, fingers crossed. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Let's do this. It's now time to get my head down and start covering some ground. Our coach Pav Bryan and the performance team have set a target of 19 miles an hour for the entire route, but it's not necessarily that simple through the hills of Cornwall. Thirty-three kilometers had been covered, and the time had come for my first stint. There is no looking back now, so here goes. Thirty, thirty-three kilometers for the first hour. So I was hoping anything north of thirty-two would be good. It's pretty hilly, a few times to get through, but um, average two hundred and thirty-nine watts. So I was trying to trying to set on two forty. So yeah, I mean obviously I'm fresh, but bang on the numbers for first hour. Before I knew it, my hour was up and Mark set off on his second stint. It's so much fun because it's on such fast roads that we got a tailwind, so I find myself sitting like 70 gear an hour. I was like, what the? It's, um, I, can't, I love like getting back into like a challenge though. It's like, just gets exciting getting on the road and having a team around you. But um, I mean, for that segment, I average 42k an hour. Which is quite quick. <laughs> and my max was 40, 40, 73. I was just saying, it's crazy how like, how long it feels when you're on the bike. And then when you stop and you get in the car, you just literally get like that. Before you know it, you're think, thinking about getting on the bike again.
our pace was way up. The fast roads and the wind on our back was giving us a helping hand, but how long would it last? We all know Hank loves speed, and sometimes he can get carried away sitting at a tempo that isn't sustainable when they were looking at a 48-hour effort. The team was getting slightly worried Hank was going to burn out. You all right? Yeah, I was alongside him chatting with him. Yeah, he was just, he was just kind of trying to match. I think he pulled some pairs, but, you know, he's going a little bit quicker, but he will do, you know, his life. But uh, just tell him to ride his own ride. I know, that's why I keep, we're all saying the same thing. I'm not, I'm not trying to keep track with him. No, and you shouldn't. No, it's not. So it's coming up to four o'clock and uh, we left Land's End bang on midday and we're already in Devon. So uh, these big rollers, they're fine at the moment because legs are fresh. But I'm just trying not to burn too many matches because it'll be tomorrow, this time tomorrow. And uh, you know, heading for 48 hours, that will really hurt. It's strange because I'm not gonna get to see Hank on this whole ride, except for the odd cheer at the roadside. So yeah, it kind of feels like quite a solo effort, although I'm relying on him to make his hours count and vice versa. So if either of us fail, we all fail. But out on the road, you know, it still does feel like a proper time trial. Feel it in the legs now. Especially on them climbs. You're like, and I've got 20 hours to go. As the lights started to fade, we decided to jump on our endurance road bikes, complete with lupine lights. If you want a full rundown of our equipment, you can watch a video over on GCN Tech. The miles were ticking down, but our first big test was still ahead. The night shift. I normally love night riding, when you're alone on the roads and it's just you and the bike. But this is something different. Can we keep the tempo that we set during the day through the night? Yeah, came through Worcester there and a uh, bit of stop start again. But um, yeah, feeling okay, that's 12 hours in. So to stay on schedule, that would be us quarter of the way through. But I think in terms of distance, we're over a quarter of the way. So long, long, long way to go. But I've no idea how Hank's doing. It's so weird just doing these handovers. And he looks strong, but I'm gonna try and get some sleep now. I guess I don't wanna sleep for more than 20 minutes, half an hour, because then you go into a super deep sleep and then it's hard to get going again, but um, yeah, back on the bike in an hour's time. Right, Sleep, it. food, repeat. Everything was going pretty smoothly until I came out of Worcester and was met by an unforeseen roadblock. The team quickly found a detour, but precious time was lost and extra kilometers were added to the route. Yeah, a massive hammer blow to fragile morale in the middle of the night. God, tell you what though, I hate waking up. But like when I'm when I'm out, I just like suddenly feel good again. So it takes me like half an hour to get into it. We're on a roll. Oh, here we go again. Mm -hmm. 
was that, Mark? Yeah, it was a good shift. Uh, two o'clock in the morning, and uh, man, it hurts. It's the neck. But um, made it through Stafford, and we're piling up England. Yeah, this is the graveyard shift, and this is only night one. So uh, I'm trying not to think too far ahead because, um, yeah, clearly we need to do this all again tomorrow night. I can't how, how, how many hours I've So we've been going nearly 24 hours. So I've done, what, 10 or 11 hours on the bike at 40k an hour. And um, we've done the hard bit, we're just getting through that first night and no. Uh, we're just cracking on, but it's weird to think we're like solid way up the country now. Yeah. It's pretty crazy. Heading for 24 hours in, and I don't care how conditioned you are, the backside does start to hurt. I changed my skin suit into bib shorts in the middle of the night, just for some fresh kit. And um, away from prying eyes and cameras, I'm gonna uh, get some more chamois butter on. The night shift was over, but I was faced by another challenge. Some of the biggest climbs on the route lie ahead. And in my 11th hour, it featured the Shack climb. It's a climb that averages 3% with a max gradient of 8%, but it's not the steepness that stings the legs, it's the length. At 14 kilometers long, winding its way out of Kendall with an altitude of 420 meters, it's a tough one. This is definitely where the lightweight road bike comes into its own. Might be quite a fast transition this one. Just waiting for Hank to come over the hill and uh, the wind is picking up beautifully. It was forecast to and uh, by the time we get up past Edinburgh today, it's, uh, it's meant to be 20, 25 miles an hour. I hope it is, that would be extraordinary. It, the wind always dies down during the night, so you're kind of left to your own devices, but um, halfway through the morning now and um, yeah, that's perfectly with us. Yeah, that was a big one, just to be fair. Sorry, Jim. Average went down to 27. Every time we change over, it's a race for the support car too to jump ahead, ready for the next transfer. But sometimes traffic makes it really difficult, especially through the built up areas like Carlisle. We were held up by traffic and lost sight of Mark for a good while. But Mark being Mark, he knuckled down and kept going. I didn't know what was going on there. I was just, uh, my radio was down, so uh, I couldn't speak to the follow vehicle and uh, there was no Hank but um, got 51 kilometers in there, so that was a big stint. Got through Carlisle, um, and yeah, when you've got no idea what's going on, carry on. <laughs> With Carlisle behind us and 774 kilometers ridden, we were over half distance and on schedule, but I was starting to feel the bite. The lack of sleep, lack of recovery, and lack of energy was really starting to show.
23 hours in and we are crossed into Mark's homeland of Scotland. A milestone undoubtedly, but we still had 563 kilometers of brutal terrain to go. Whilst it was 25 degrees in Cornwall, in true Scottish fashion, I was welcomed home with gusty winds and rain. I was so excited when I got to Scotland for obvious reasons. And it started raining. <laughs> so unlike it. <laughs> it's good, eh? <laughs> the tailwind is very nice. Very, very nice. And uh, soon we'll be on the A9. Love the A9. It's not the best cycling road in the world, let's face it, but uh, it is fast and um, the pegs are sore, the backside sore, the neck is very sore, but we are ahead of schedule and um, yeah, it's exciting. Uh, just been going non-stop since 12 yesterday. Basically, everything I feel right now is pain and wanting to go to bed. But I know that's not going to happen for another 200 miles. Fantastic. Well, this is the long slog up the A9 to Abbey Moor and then Inverness. It's a, a necessary evil, I'm afraid. It's not a delightful cycling road. It's a big dual carriageway for most of it. But going into the evening, hopefully it'll quiet down. I've, I've driven this road hundreds of times, but it's not so you cycle it, you realize it's actually quite hilly. What's happening now is potentially your body's rhythms are all a little bit out of whack. Yeah. And you can tell because you go into like goose pimples and you're getting really cold when actually your, your skin's quite warm and all of that sort of stuff. So, so basically my body's going into overdrive. You, yeah, your body's just not quite sure what the hell's going on. It hasn't slept. You keep asking it to do exercise. So it's going up and down. The key thing is just keeping consistency with some fueling even when you don't want to. Okay but we just need to keep drip feeding it in. Burge is gonna go and get some of that sweet potato stuff, but so it's a bit softer, but we need to keep those carbs coming in. Because the thing is, you get into the cycle where you then start to feel sick, because actually you haven't got enough fuel in the tank, and then, but you don't want to eat anything, and it's like, it starts to spiral. It's always apprehensive getting, you know, waiting here, waiting for Mark to come around the corner and then it's my turn to just put in a shift. Um, my shift is meant to be a really hilly one now, so uh, I'm going to settle into a nice rhythm. Not bust a gut, keep them wheels turning. That's my plan. That was a hard hour. The grind. Ugh. Yeah, that kind of surprised me. Slowest hour since the start. Okay, I'm not my freshest, but... horrible patch and I didn't want to tell anyone because I didn't want to be just now on the bike no like I went through a horrible bit where I was just puking and I was getting like a fever because like Laura was saying like your body's just not used to like working out every freaking hour Going back 
section then. That's just amazing the difference an arc can make. Anyone who's ridden ultra endurance before will know what that is. Like you can just be in the pit. And the only thing that's certain is change. If you're feeling great, you'll feel terrible. If you're feeling terrible, the assumption, if you're a complete novice at this game, is that if you start to feel bad, the only way is to get worse. But actually the amazing thing about endurance is your body's just got an amazing way of, um, of, of, of bouncing back. I mean, it's fueling, it's hydration, it's mindset, small changes, cheeky teammates. But it is, it's amazing. Like, I was just in such a dark place when I got off the bike. And I'm sure I'll be in the dark place again in a few hours, but I mean, right now, it's all good. As we settled in for a second night, John O'Groats was nearly in our sights and the mood in the team was high. Um, I reckon it's less than 100 miles to go, so I reckon it's five shifts. Five shifts from here. So I've just done one from Inverness. So basically, uh, yeah, I reckon I've got two more. Hank's got three. If it works out, then uh, Hank will have the final shift, which is fair, because uh, I got the first one. Just nuts. I thought best case scenario would be riding in there tomorrow lunchtime. It's uh, quarter to 11 at night. We're gonna be there in the middle of the night. I'm uh, more than ready to get to John O'Groats, that's what I'm thinking right now. It's just gone midnight, and according to the plan, we still have 12 hours riding to go. But uh, I don't know how, with our lack of experience doing time trial efforts like this, but we've just had the perfect conditions, but quite a sting in the tail, this last section, it's quite lumpy. And uh, yeah, I'm sure I'll look back very fondly, but right now I want to get off my bike. Well, I just passed the sign for 50 miles to go. Cannot believe it. We left Land's End at midday yesterday. Absolutely nuts. Two more, two more hours of pedaling. So it's all looking good. I reckon we're gonna do Lands and John O'Groats with just two people in under 43 hours, which is quite something. My final stint. Oh, this is my least favourite part. It's freezing. A lot of fun you get on the, on the drops, otherwise I puke. I need, I don't feel too well, mate. to be said, I was really starting to feel it. The position on the bike was making it almost impossible to digest food, leaving me depleted and with really painful acid reflux. The team were getting really worried, but the finish line was getting closer. I can't say I'm in the best shape to actually enjoy it. 
But it's been a hell of a long journey. And to think we've done it in potentially under 40 hours is quite something. I can currently see the sea, which is a nice sight. And I think I'm not far away now. What a journey. Well done, guys. Soft effort. That was Sunday. Oh. Nice work, team. Couldn't have done it without you. Oh, what a ride. Hey, buddy. Oh, give me a hug, dude. Oh, what a ride. Well done. Oh, pretty, mate. Tough effort, buddy. Tough pretty. Effort. Hang on, time check. 3.46. Oh. You alright? Yeah. Got some bad acid reflux to me going on. Oh. Man. oh, what a ride. 1,348 kilometers, the entire length of Britain in 39 hours and 40 minutes, averaging 34 kilometers an hour. Job done. <laughs>